within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And I'll note at the outset that this hearing has a hard stop of 1 p.m. This is traditional for the Fed chair, um, and uh, which we intend to strictly observe. Um, <clears throat> I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an, an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, uh, for your testimony today. Um, this week, you stated that the Fed will, quote, stay the course until the job is done, uh, and that is to restore price stability. This is positive, but you know as well as I do, you're facing a very strong headwind from the political left. Democrats are pressuring the Fed to stray from its narrow mandate. Without, uh, it's a page out of their same old progressive playbook. When they don't have the votes to achieve something here in Congress, they turn to regulators. And now, Chair Powell, they're looking at you and the Federal Reserve. President Biden's kowtowing to the far left is what got us into this inflationary mess. I urge you to reject the ideologues who put their social agenda ahead of economic prosperity. High prices continue to eat away at workers' wages and retirees' incomes. Since President Biden took office, we've experienced inflation at rates not seen uh, since the late 70s and early 80s. Inflation uh, rapidly deceler uh, accelerated after Democrats passed their so-called American Rescue Plan, which poured nearly $2 trillion of inflationary fuel into the economy. By June of last year, the Consumer Price Index showed inflation skyrocketed from below 2 percent to nearly 9 percent and personal uh, consumption expenditures, the Fed's preferred measure of consumer prices, ballooned to 7 percent. Instead of being rescued by uh, Democrats, Americans were punished with pain at the grocery store and sticker shock at the pump. <coughs> While inflation is now, believed, uh, it is now below its mid-2022 peak, it is uh, persisting at rates well above the Fed's target. It remains broad-based and continues to hammer Americans' pocketbooks. In fact, a recent Gallup poll shows half of the respondents say they are worse off financially than a year ago. It's clear that there's still a long way to go in the effort to bring down costs. I look forward to hearing you reaffirm your commitment to that work today. Republicans also want to hear from you regarding some concerning developments at the Federal Reserve on the regulatory front. Recently, the Federal Reserve's Vice Chair for Supervision announced a quote-unquote holistic review of bank capital in the Fed's regulatory regime. However, it seems that only a small group within the Fed knows what this means, uh, what it entails, how much review is, is being vetted by the full board, and the, the type of quantitative analysis the Fed is performing. The Fed shouldn't operate in the shadows, especially when the regulation in question can have broad and significant economic effects. It's also unclear the motivation for the Fed's holistic review, particularly when so many board members have stated that the banking system is very well capitalized, and any review of, um, of, uh, of uh, capital standards should be targeted. It also appears the Federal Reserve Board is laying the groundwork for climate policy to be implemented through the uh, Fed regulation uh, with an opening salvo to quote unquote uh, uh, of quote unquote scenario analysis. Addressing an issue like climate change is important, but a policy that should originate here in Congress by the elected representatives of the people, not the central bank. As you said, the Fed needs to stick to its knitting. I agree. Uh, there is concern for many that the Fed is picking up new needles and knitting partisan sweaters. At such a precarious time for our economy here at home and the global economy, that would be a mistake. Thank you for being here today. I look forward to your testimony and the questions by our members. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, Ms. Waters, uh, for four minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chair Powell. Since your last visit, our country under the leadership of President Biden has made major progress to improve economic conditions, including adding a record 12 million jobs, reducing unemployment to its lowest rate in 54 years, while also reducing 
the deficit by $1.7 trillion. Unfortunately, many families are still struggling uh, to afford basic necessities uh, because of inflation. What's more, interest rate hikes are making borrowing, especially for mortgages, outrageously expensive. Since I raised this concern for you in a November letter, the rate hikes continue to have an outsized impact on housing costs, which are, as you know, a primary driver of core inflation. But Mr. Chair, I think that you will agree that Congress also has a role. That's why I'm somewhat disappointed that after two months, Republicans have taken no serious action to address inflation. By this time last Congress, House Democrats had passed the American Rescue Plan to provide relief from the ongoing pandemic, which included our committee's efforts to provide $70 billion for homeowners, renters, businesses, and first responders. If Republicans are looking for ideas, committee Democrats have put forth additional bills, like the Build Back Better Act, to bring down costs for Americans, especially housing costs. Even more concerning, we just months, we're just months away from an economic catastrophe beyond what we have ever seen, including spiking interest rates, massive job losses, and global instability. I'm talking about the threats by Republican leadership to force a default on our nation's debt if we don't agree to their demands to cut Social Security, Medicare, or other critical programs. You've urged Congress to take immediate action to raise the debt ceiling. But rather than focusing on this very real issue, the first bill that committee Republicans brought to the floor instead suggested that Social Security and Medicare are socialist threats to America. Since then, we have considered legislation related to deregulating securities and banking laws and countering threats from China, but Republicans have completely ignored the biggest economic threat to businesses, consumers, and our economy defaulting on our debt. Last month, I wrote a letter to Chair McHenry urging him to take this matter seriously and hold a hearing, but I'm still waiting for a response. I hope Republicans will listen today to the real consequences that even the mere threat of a default would have for everyone in this country. And finally, I'm so pleased that we're finally making progress on diversity and inclusion for key positions at the Fed, including last year's historic confirmation of Dr. Lisa Cook to serve as the very first black woman on the Federal Reserve Board. With the board's vice chair and Kansas City Fed president positions vacant. I think President Biden and Kansas City Fed Board should build on this progress by, per by seriously considering diverse candidates for these positions. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The ranking member yields back the balance of my time, asking him his consent to submit for the record uh, my letter to uh, Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen uh, from February 28th. Uh, asking for an update on the X date for the debt ceiling. I also ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the latest CBO long-term budget outlook on the unsustainability of our debt, um, most recently released. Uh, and without objection, so ordered, I'll now recognize the Chair of the Financial Institution Subcommittee Chair, Mr. Barr, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today to discuss the Federal Reserve's monetary policy actions in a time of economic uncertainty, mixed economic data, historic inflation that continues to plague families and businesses around the country. It is paramount that the Federal Reserve remain vigilant on reducing inflation, anchoring inflation expectations, and restoring price stability at the Fed's 2% target. I also look forward to discussing the Fed's regulatory and supervisory activities 
As the Fed reviews the bank capital framework, it needs to consider the impact to the real economy and our global competitiveness when raising capital requirements and sidelining capital would work at cross purposes with monetary tightening, constraining the supply side when we need more, not less, investment to fix supply chains and reduce inflation. Tailored regulations are required by the, by, of the Fed by law, and a one-size-fits-all approach would be the wrong path to take. Finally, I urge the Fed, in your words, to stick to its knitting and not attempt to be a climate regulator. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now recognize the ranking member of the Financial Institution Subcommittee, um, Mr. Foster, for one minute. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Powell, for being here today. Today is the 15th anniversary of when I was first elected to Congress and placed on the Financial Services Committee, just as the economy was about to collapse. And so that was my trial by fire, the emergency response to rescue the economy and the legislative response, the Dodd-Frank Act, that successfully stabilized our financial system. So 15 years later, as I take my place as the ranking member on the Committee of Oversight over U.S. Banking and Monetary Policy, I recall the solemn oath that I swore to myself back then to make sure that this kind of calamity never happens again. The monetary policy report that we're receiving today is largely a narrative of a return to normal. Lead times to manufacturers are back to pre-COVID levels. The job market retains supernatural strength and inflation is responding more or less as predicted to the usual measures. And by far the largest threat on the horizon is a repeat of the 2011 default crisis. Congress has the power to avoid that, and we owe it to the American people to do so. And I yield back. Today, we welcome the testimony of Jerome Powell, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Chair Powell was appointed, uh, reappointed and sworn in for a second four-year term as chair on May 23, 2022. Chair Powell also serves as chairman of the Federal Open Markets Committee and the system's principal monetary policymaking, which is the system's principal monetary policymaking body. Um, Chair Powell, we thank you for taking the time to be here. We will recognize you for five minutes to give an oral presentation or testimony. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Chairman Powell, you're recognized. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and other members of the committee, good morning. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation is causing significant hardship and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Over the past year, we've taken forceful actions to tighten the stance of monetary policy. We've covered a lot of ground and the full effects of our tightening so far are yet to be felt. Even so, we have more work to do. Our policy actions are guided by our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of labor market conditions that benefit all. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. <clears throat> the data from January on employment, consumer spending, manufacturing production, and inflation have partly reversed the softening trends that we had seen in the data just a month ago. Some of this reversal likely reflects the unseasonably warm weather in January in much of the country. Still, the breadth of the reversal, along with the revisions to the previous quarter, suggest that inflationary pressures are running higher than expected at the time of our previous FOMC meeting. From a broader perspective, inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year, but remains well above our longer run objective of 2%. The 12-month change in total PCE prices has slowed from its peak of 7% in June to 5.4% in January, as energy prices have declined and supply chain bottlenecks have eased. Over the past 12 months, core PCE inflation, which excludes the volatile food and energy prices, was 4.7%. As supply chain bottlenecks have eased and tighter policy has restrained demand, inflation in the core goods sector has fallen. And while housing services inflation remains too high, the flattening out in rents evident in recently signed leases points to a deceleration in this component, component of inflation over the year ahead. That said, there is little sign of disinflation thus far in the category of core services excluding housing, which accounts for more than half of core consumer expenditures. To restore price stability, we will need to see lower inflation in this sector and there will very likely be some softening in labor market conditions. Although nominal wage gains have slowed 
somewhat in recent months, they remain above what is consistent with 2% inflation and current trends in productivity. Strong wage growth is good for workers, but only if it's not eroded by inflation. Turning to growth, the US economy slowed significantly last year with real GDP rising at a below trend pace of 0.9%. Although consumer spending appears to be expanding at a solid pace this quarter, other recent indicators point to subdued growth of spending and production. Activity in the housing sector continues to weaken, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. Despite the slowdown in growth, the labor market remains extremely tight. The unemployment rate was 3.4% in January, its lowest level since 1969. Job gains remain very strong in January, while the supply of labor has continued to lag. As of the end of December, there were 1.9 job openings for each unemployed individual, close to the all-time peak recorded last March, while unemployment insurance claims have remained near historic lows. Turning to monetary policy, with inflation well above our longer-run goal of 2% and with the labor market remaining extremely tight, the FOMC has continued to tighten the stance of monetary policy, raising interest rates by 4.5 percentage points over the past year. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly re reducing the size of our balance sheet. We are seeing the effects of our policy actions on demand in the most interest sensitive sectors of the economy. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. In light of the cumulative tightening of monetary policy and the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, the committee slowed the pace of interest rate increases over its past two meetings. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting, taking into account the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation. Although inflation has been moderating in recent months, the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. As I mentioned, the latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than previously anticipated. If, and I stress that no decision has been made on this, but if the totality of the data were to indicate that faster tightening is warranted, we'd be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. Restoring price stability will likely require that we maintain a restrictive stance of monetary policy for some time. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. We will stay the course until the job is done. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Federal Reserve will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of questioning. Uh, Chairman Powell, there's been a lot of discussion over the last 24 hours about the effect of rate increases on the economy. A lot of debate about what you said yesterday in the Senate. Um, how does, but no one asked you this directly. We have a March meeting coming up, Open Markets Committee meeting coming up in two weeks. Um, how do you think about the March meeting? What's your approach to that? What are we likely to see? Thank you. So I, I, I won't repeat what I, what I just said in my testimony, but, but if I turn to the March meeting, um, I guess I would say that we have some potentially important data coming up, uh, data to be analyzed. Uh, one of them came out at exactly 10 o'clock. That would be the JOLTS report, which, of course, I haven't seen, having been sitting here at 10 o'clock. But we're also getting a jobs report on Friday <clears throat> and a CPI and PPI inflation report next week. So those will be important, and we'll scrutinize them. When we say that we're going to be looking at the totality of the data, which is what I said, that does include these, these reports yet to come. They're going to be important in our assessment of the higher readings that we have very recently received and of the overall direction of the economy and of our progress in bringing inflation down. And we'll be carefully analyzing them. 
Um, again, I, we have not made any decision about the March meeting. We're not going to do that until we see the, the additional data. The larger point, though, <clears throat> is that we're not on a preset path and that we will be guided by the incoming data and the evolving outlook. But you've also said hire longer. Is yes. that still the case? Yes. Yeah, so, and I, as I said in my testimony, uh, we look at the, at the data since January and, and, and also the revisions to the November and December inflation data, and they suggest that uh, the ultimate level of interest rates is so to repeat, to higher than we'd expected. And what are those economic factors? So um, going back to January, as I mentioned, the, the, the nice, so, the softer inflation readings of November and December were revised up. We got a very strong uh, inflation report for January. We got an extraordinarily strong employment report, very strong consumer spending, uh, strong manufacturing data right across the board. And as I pointed out, some of that may have been affected by the very warm January weather, but nonetheless, all of it pointed in the same direction. Okay, let's move to regulation. Um, uh, Chair Powell, in January, the Federal Reserve put out a policy statement noting that digital asset custody is a permissible activity if done in a safe and sound manner. Um, however, uh, if a bank can de demonstrate to the Fed that it can conduct uh, that activity in safe and sound manner, the capital impact of the SEC's staff accounting bulletin effectively precludes banks from offering digital asset custody service at any scale. Um, are you aware of this staff accounting bulletin by the Securities Exchange Commission and its impact on custodial services? I, I am aware of it. Of course, it's an SEC accounting bulletin. This is, this is SAB 121, I think. And That's I'm right. Certainly aware of it, and you know we do follow um, uh, general accepted accounting principles in in our in our yes. capital regulation. Okay. Well, without objection, I'll submit to the um, submit for the record uh, my uh, letter to the bank regulars about this. Uh, so while the Fed says it can be done in a safe and sound manner, the Securities Exchange Commission has regulated it so that it cannot be done. Uh, next question is uh, certainly about bank capital standards. Uh, you got questions about this yesterday. Uh, Chair Barr has announced a holistic review of capital requirements. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, there are a lot of questions about this process. Um, and uh, previous statements by members of the, uh, the, the Fed governors um, uh, about the adequacy of current, current capital standards. Um, and so while the Vice Chair for Supervision has announced that the Fed will engage in a holistic review of capital regulation, is that Fed staff, is that done at the, uh, you know, at the governor's, le the, the board level? Um, what is the process? There are a lot of questions that people have uh, about his statements. Um, and so we want to understand why it's necessary for the, uh, the Fed to conduct a holistic review and what that process is. Um, and uh, so, you know, my general question is, do, do you still uh, uh, agree with your previous statements about uh, the adequacy on a generalized basis of, of our financial system? Uh, or are we to read into this that we're not adequately capitalized and there's, there's a, a high level of risk in the system that we're unaware of at this point? Thank you. So the, the, the why really just is that uh, as a new vice chair for supervision, vice chair Barr has, has launched into, he's taking a fresh look at everything, including capital. That, that actually is typical of the last two people to have this job. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of um, the process, it's, you know, it's con certainly conducted under Vice Chair Barr's leadership with, with input from the staff and, you know, discussions with uh, governors on that committee. And uh, I'm kept uh, broadly apprised about what's going on. But the, the, the bottom line is there, nothing has, been pro nothing has been proposed to the board. Nothing has been formalized at this point. It's a lot of work that's going on. I think discussions are going on, meetings with industry and that kind of thing. When we get to that, to the place where that's appropriate, uh, you know, the board will be carefully briefed, ultimately will vote on a proposal, and that proposal will go out for comment, and we'll, we'll, we'll solicit comment from uh, any and all commenters, and we'll look very carefully at that. So it'll be a, a, a wide open uh, process in the sunshine. Thank you. I yield back. Now recognize the general, uh, gentleman from California, the ranking member, rank, uh, Ms. Waters. Thank you very much. Chair Powell, I agree with what you said on February 1st that Congress must raise the debt limit because of what you described as the highly risky consequences of failing to do so. You are perhaps the most important expert on the debt limit 
which is why I find it very concerning that your recommendation to raise the debt limit in a timely manner is being ignored by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I'm also concerned that the consequences of this brinksmanship are imminent. Fitch Ratings said this week uh, they may seriously look at downgrading the U.S. debt based on the escalating brinksmanship they are observing. Even if Congress ultimately addresses the debt limit at the last minute, this is history repeating itself. Standard and Poor's downgraded our debt back in 2011 when Republicans last controlled the House and threatened default. The Bipartisan Policy Center later found that the 2011 debt limit debate cost us $18.9 billion in higher borrowing costs, even though we never defaulted. To put that into perspective, that could have been leveraged to provide up to 20, 200 billion in loans to small businesses through the State Small Business Credit Initiative, or to provide hundreds of thousands of people down payment assistance to buy their first home. So I want to emphasize that House Republicans, including most of the Republicans on this committee, had no qualms about paying our debts when Trump was in office. Three times they addressed the debt ceiling in a timely manner without holding our country hostage. But Republicans are now are ready to tear down the hard work of Americans everywhere to weather the pandemic and build back a strong recovery. Chair Powell, can you describe for us the risk you see if Congress continues to delay action on the debt limit, both for our economy and for individuals and families? Let me start briefly by saying that we have no role and seek no role in what is really at the heart of fiscal policy, except uh, I, I will limit myself to the two things that other Fed chairs have, have said about this. One is just that Congress raising the debt ceiling is really the only alternative. There are no rabbits in hats to be pulled out on this. Two really is just that no one should assume that the Fed can protect the economy from, from uh, you know, the, the non-payment of, of, uh, of the government's bills, let alone a, a, a debt default of some, of some, or something of that nature, which we don't think will happen here, but no one should be thinking that we have the tools to, to, to protect the economy from all the potential effects of that. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to miss uh, what you said. I uh, somewhat quoted you uh, when you said that Congress must raise the debt limit because of what you described as a highly risky, risky consequence of failing to do so. Is that your language? Well, must in the sense that that's, it's really the only way for, for the debt limit to be raised is Congress has, must act. I, I, again, these are fiscal discussions, and we're not, don't, we don't want to be a part of them, and uh, really they're between you know, elected officials. But you are an expert on the subject. Well, I spent a lot of time on this, as you'll recall. As an expert priorities. on this subject, you are concerned about the high risky, risky consequence of failing to do so. Is that correct? Did I correctly quote you? That's correct. Thank yeah. you. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, again, uh, let me just uh, go a little bit further. Um, the chair mentioned that he had either written a letter or maybe even had some conversation from Janet Yellen about uh, the time limits uh, that she had attempted to describe. Is it your understanding that she said she could maneuver and kind of manipulate things so that she paid the bills that were coming due, uh, but this could only last until about June? Is that your understanding? Honestly, I would really have to not try to interpret the secretary's words for you. She, that's really up to her to do. Can she keep us afloat until about June? I don't, honestly. That's not for me to say. That's, these, are, these are really questions for the secretary. I'm sorry, Ms. White. Have you had any conversation with her I, about the statement that she made about being able uh, to manip manipulate of the debt and pay bills that were coming due out of another account, et cetera. Did you have that conversation with her? The, the conversations that you and I have privately don't go anywhere. I don't talk about them with anybody. And the conversations I have with, with Secretary Yellen, I don't. I don't. Okay, and I don't want to get the gentlelady you. Gentlelady's time has ex expired. I beg your pardon? The gentlelady's time has expired. 
Do I, did I have equal time with you? You sure did. He went over time. If I, I, if I did, thank you. I yield back. I now recognize the vice chair of the full committee, Mr. Hill of Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Chair Powell, for being with us. You're welcome anytime. Don't wait till we ask. If you want to volunteer and come, we, we love having your views on many topics. Thanks for talking about your commitment to price stability. You know we've had this discussion last June between us. Of, I do think that's the primary mission of the Fed, and I think it should be the only priority of the Fed is price stability because it's the legislative branch and the executive branch that really are responsible for, quote, full employment and having that policy uh, environment and making sure that that's right. So your commitment to price stability is welcomed by this uh, committee. Yesterday in the Senate, you uh, suggested that you supported a uh, regulatory framework, uh, a broadly regulatory framework for digital assets. Is that, is that right? Yes. And is it your view that if we had a regulatory framework here in the United States for digital assets, that there'd be more transparency and rules of the road for both consumers, investors, and developers? Absolutely. And would it, if we had those rules of the road for business seeking to use uh, and develop blockchain uh, as a potential uh, new technology in their business and tokenized payments that Again, that would be beneficial to business to know how to go about that. Yes, and to assure that it's all done in a safe and sound manner when we're talking about banks. Right. And then, as I, my next point would be exactly that, to help banks, uh, investment brokers, custodians understand uh, how they could even participate in that market in a safe and sound manner. Do you agree that a regulatory framework would help on that? Yes. And then, and then finally, uh, we've grown up in our country and it's unique in the world that we have a dual banking system and due to a quirk uh, here in Congress over a hundred years ago we have uh, insurance is regulated exclusively by the states so uh, would you uh, believe that that regulatory framework would also have to preserve some sort of role uh, subject to safety and soundness you know for state uh, states to play some role in that regulatory framework for digital assets I, uh, I, let me just say, I think that it work, certainly works in banking and insurance. I have no problem with those. Um, right. I'd but think you, about you think it could, you consider it possible that it could also work in digital assets? Certainly possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, turning to a, a topic that's been a subject here for nearly four years, central bank digital currencies, Article 1 of the Constitution reserves coins and coin issuance, money issuance to the Congress. And we've in turn delegated that to the U.S. Treasury, uh, which has, since 1912, uh, engaged the Federal Reserve as their fiscal agent. Uh, you've testified here many times before that to issue a central bank digital currency, that that would be, have to be authorized by statute by Congress. Is that still your testimony? So that is absolutely the case as it relates to a retail CBDC. There are right. you know, potential uh, forms of a wholesale CBDC that would be we need to look at. It's less clear. But we've always been talking about retail CBDC, and, and that's, uh, that's something we would certainly need congressional approval for. And what would be a parameter on something that's not a retail CBDC where you think that that could be issued in some form or fashion without Congress's direct statutory so, authorization? It would, so it would be, let's, for example, it would just be an, uh, something between banks, so it would look an awful lot like a bank reserve. And you, you might ask, well, why would we need it? And that's, that's a really good question, too. Yeah. But it's just something that's literally within a wholesale market. But that speaks that you might have a, a blockchain between banks and the Fed using a central bank digital currency token to settle transactions institutionally inside the, the yeah. Yes. So that leads me to Fed Now, uh, which is supposed to be up and running, I think, this summer somewhat behind the, the scene there. Uh, I would like to ask you to formally have this full committee briefed on that by the Federal Reserve. I know uh, the chair of the Kansas City Bank was involved. She's now left. And I think the committee has a lot of questions about Fed now, how, it, how its interoperability will work, how it's going to roll out. And also, just a question that uh, We've been asked that why the Fed wire system isn't up 24 hours a day, seven days a week now to benefit consumers that are using Venmo. Do you have a thought on that? I, 
I'm not sure why we're not 24-7 on that. And we, of course, we'd be delighted to uh, come up and brief the committee on, uh, on Fed. That'd be good. We'll take you up on that and uh, the right person from the Fed. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll now recognize the uh, chair of the, I'm sorry, the ranking member of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, Mr. Sherman of California, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for bringing to our committee's attention several years ago the importance of tough legacy LIBOR, some $16 trillion of instruments where the creditor wouldn't know how much the debtor was supposed to pay. Um, this committee, we passed legislation over a year before the LIBOR hit the fan. Uh, you issued regulations seven months before the absolute deadline. Uh, I hope we do this in other areas, and it's my understanding that with those final regulations, we're done, uh, and uh, we've solved the, 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 the LIBOR issue. Uh, is that correct? That's my understanding as well. Good. Um, people talk about inflation, and they somehow say that it's a matter of the personalities and politics in the United States. Others argue that the entire world is hit by inflation because Ukraine and COVID. I think we've got the answer to this question uh, in that inflation is uh, considerably higher in the Eurozone than it is in the United States uh, today. Uh, and it's very hard to say that Joe Biden is responsible for inflation in Germany. Uh, I commend the uh, ranking member for bringing up the debt limit and the harm that's already done to our economy. If we solve the problem tomorrow, we had less investment than we would have had yesterday. Um, and I would say that I commend the president. He's going to issue a budget plan tomorrow. And perhaps in their time, one of our, our Republican colleagues can tell us when the Republican budget plan will be released. We are all eagerly awaiting it. Housing is a huge part of inflation, and it's We've left it to local uh, government, but the permitting process there guarantees scarcity, which guarantees uh, uh, high housing costs. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair um, we've talked back in 2001 and several times uh, even before that about wire fraud. And uh, having just bought a home, I saw the process up front. Everybody's very nervous about one thing, and that is, will the buyer of the house be tricked into wiring their down payment to the wrong account? Or will the seller, uh, the uh, buyer be tricked, in, or the escrow agent be tricked into sending the money uh, to someone other than the seller of the property? We talked about this back in 2001, where I urged you with your FedNow system, which I'm glad is on track to move forward, um, to have what the Brits have. When you send the wire, you identify not only the number of the account you're sending it to, but also the name of the person or entity that's supposed to receive that. Uh, at that time, back in 2001, you said that pay matching is not the best way to do it. There are other ways to do it, and that you'd be happy to get back to me as to how you're going to make sure that a, uh, an, email, a, a, an email from a Nigerian prince does not get uh, the wired funds, particularly in a housing transaction, wired to an account number that turns out to be in Lagos. Um, what progress do you have? When can, we, when can home buyers have a system where they're sending it to a named payee as well as to a number? So we, I hope we did come back in a timely way to you on that. Um, but. Uh, it's a, it's a problem you've brought to our attention, you're right, over many years, uh, and we continue to focus on, on, on that. Well, the, bureau, the, the bureaucrats who are working on this don't want to do what the Brits did. They've proven it can be done. You said you were going to accomplish the same goal in some other way, and it has been a while, and it's not solved, nor are you aware of any solution. I would hope that you would go back and say, we don't want to add this anxiety to every real estate transaction. Um, we uh, go back to the drawing boards, follow what the, the Brits have done, and have uh, pay uh, matching. Uh, finally, as to uh, crypto, um, cryptocurrency says what it means. Hidden money, that's what it means. 
And uh, if we impose uh, know your customer and uh, anti-money laundering statutes to it, it won't be crypto anymore. What crypto wants is to have part of its ecosystem above the waterline, visible and subject to know your customer, and then have the rest of the iceberg below the waterline. Um, Gentlemen, time time's expired. expired. I will now uh, go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate not only your professionalism, but your uh, direction at us. Chairman Powell, I know that the uh, Fed considers divergences, and you talked about it in, as you spoke in your opening statement, about consumer price index, <clears throat> personal consumer expenditures, inflation, GDP, and all these things are talked about in your uh, report, uh, monetary report, uh, March 3, 2023. Thank you. Uh, a couple days ago, I had an opportunity to see that a, an, an economist, uh, Art Laffer, Arthur Laffer, uh, produced a report that spoke about literally this country doubling GDP. Now, I know we're putting CPI, PCE, inflation, all these things into a mix. But he said that if we made changes in health care to efficiencies, we could double the current GDP rate. My question to you that I hope you can answer is, what do you think about that? Is that something that is in this document that I have missed? And it's seemingly to a person who follows this, as Art Laffer does for 50 years, what do you think is an important way to look at efficiencies in healthcare? Thank you. So no, that, that's not in our, in our monetary policy report. Uh, I'll just say one thing, and that is we do, we do spend something like 1. Uh, Seven, sorry, 17 or 18 in that range percent of GDP delivering health care. Other, other similarly wealthy countries spend 10 percent. So it's the delivery system. It's not that the benefits are incredibly rich or anything like that. It's just that the delivery system is very expensive. That's a trillion dollars a year that we spend and, and get nothing for it. This is fiscal policy, but I'm, I'm responding to your. So I, I would think that he may have meant that if we, if we had a delivery system that, that saved that, that, that trillion dollars that doesn't really get us anything, uh, then, then that would be great for the economy, which I would agree with. So you've spoken of supply chain disruptions because it in fact is an inhibitor or an accelerator as we gain that advantage. You just talked about some seemingly which would offer some validation to Mr. Laffer as he spoke about the huge importance of this is that something you should start paying attention to, to where policy people, not only at the Fed, but your Fed banks around the country would start looking at and start putting pressure on us to, get, to gain those efficiencies as a result of a global view? So on supply chains generally, they have suddenly been tremendously important uh, in, in inflation, as you know, for the last couple of years and for the first time really have been something that we've had to study carefully. In terms of, of, of healthcare delivery, that is strictly a question for you and for you know, the, the parts of the government that are charged with it. The Fed does not have a role to play and, and does not seek a role in that. Does not see a role. And, and yet, as I look at this, you've got a role in projecting confidence You've got a role in education. You've got a role in who's in the workplace. You've got a role. Uh, my talk, my discussion, interest rates, my, and yet my point is it's such a staggering number that impacts us. i uh, just love to have you go back. Perhaps we from this committee need to give you some direction on that. But I think you've, your testimony today recognizes the staggering impact on that. I don't think it's political. The answer may be political, but I think the actual numbers are not political. It's an inefficiency that is happening across the country, not a regional matter. And so I 
wanted to get your take on that, and I appreciate you being here as always. Thank you for your confidence and your hard work that you give this country. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. We'll now recognize the ranking member of the Agriculture Committee, Mr. Scott of Georgia, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, welcome back, uh, Chair Chairman Powell. Now, Chairman Powell, listen to me very carefully here because I think we're on the verge of making a terrible mistake. Back in 2008, if you recall, uh, Barney Frank then and Miss Waters asked me to take a look and kind of work with you and the Fed. You were a board member in 2008. And we came to the conclusion that we needed a more equitable playing field between our large banks uh, like Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, and our regional and smaller banks like Truist and uh, our community banks. And we, and we changed that. But now I hear that the Fed and the FDIC plan to drop a new rule which seeks to apply the long-term and higher capital requirements that were created, and you and I did this back in 2008, and you remember, that were created for the Goldman Sachs and for them. And now we want to apply these rules to the regional banks. There's a big difference. And we've omitted this difference if you proceed in this manner. I think it's very misguided. It works. And you and I worked on this. You recall this. You were a board member. And we saw that we needed to have a better playing field to protect. And if you all go along with this, it could put many of our regional banks and small community banks out of business. So I want you to reverse this. First of all, tell me, am I speaking the truth? Are you all planning to all of a sudden here? put these smaller and regional banks under the same heavy or uh, financial load as your large worldwide banks? Tell me. No, we're not planning that. We, um, we well, believe strongly and always have in tailoring uh, to uh, address the, the different size and risk characteristics of financial institutions, and certainly uh, nothing like that for the regionals. They, they won't have anything like what the what the very large, most systemically important banks have in terms of overall regulation. Yeah, because I remember clearly you and I were back, I think we were on this side then, talking about this in this same committee room. And you worked with us on that. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, where is that coming from? I mean, it's, it's a concern. It's just a rumor. Have, have there been any discussions about removing the uh, playing field and the guardrails we have here, the differentiations in the uh, requirements between the regional banks, community banks, and your larger global banks? So There's not, nothing to that? Well, I would say this. We, we're required by the law now, and, and we're doing this. Dodd-Frank actually required us. Yes, so Suggested we did. that we should tailor and then the uh, S2155 then required it. And anything that we do right. will, reflect, will reflect appropriate tailoring. All right, so we, we, that's off the board. We're not going to change and put the smaller and regional banks under the same financial obligation role as the large banks. We got that right from you, correct? Yeah, that's right. All right, good. Now let me turn to China. I'm really worried about China. And 
right now, people may not know it, but China is the world's largest economy in terms of purchasing power. Now, at our last meeting, I, I talked about this move where we didn't blow the balloon up. And this is an example of what I was pointing out. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, we'll now recognize the chair of the Science Committee, Mr. Lucas of Oklahoma, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, I'd like to follow up on the topic of capital standards. One of those things we've discussed many times together. As you know, commodity markets have, been a, have seen significant volatility in the last uh, few years. And during times of tremendous economic uncertainty, like we've seen, end users turn to the markets to hedge risk, particularly those in the agriculture and energy sectors. And I know that the Fed is early in the review process of potential changes in capital requirements. Can you, uh, well, I'll ask anyway. Can you commit to ensuring that these changes will not increase the cost for banks providing those commodity derivatives to end users? I, I that's a really specific, uh, can, I, can I go look at that? I, I mean, I, I'm not actually sure that, that, that the, the work even addresses that. So um, Fair I'm point. happy to come back to you on that. And that uh, particular response makes me feel better. Because after all, those products are very important to my folks. Uh, and make a great deal of difference in how they're able to address their issues. So, as you discussed earlier, and as you've consistently assured, the Fed's not a climate-making policymaker. You and I have talked about this issue, again, many times in the past. However, I'm concerned that the Fed could be heading in that direction and could be laying the groundwork for climate-related stress tests that would reduce access to capital for entire sectors of the economy. This would also open up the Federal Reserve, potentially to political pressure, and force the Fed, in fact, to make policy decisions related to climate change. We've seen, for example, this administration turn to regulators to impose climate policy as an alternative to the legislative process. Chairman Powell, how careful are you in ensuring that the Fed does not place itself into the climate debate? And how can Congress ensure that the Fed's regulatory toolkit is not, shall we say, warped into creating uh, climate policy outcomes. So I think we do have an, a narrow uh, but real role there, which is around bank supervision, making sure the banks understand and can manage their, their risks over time from climate. I think my colleagues and I all understand that it's a, it's a tightly circumscribed role that we're playing and that we, we're not looking to, uh, you know, move into an area where, become, where we're actually becoming a climate policymaker. I would completely agree with you, though, that over time, that border needs to be very carefully guarded. And I, I will tell you that I will, I will do that as long as, as long as I'm at the Board of Governors. I very much appreciate that, because, again, it's a very important issue to the Third District of Oklahoma. Traditional production agriculture, oil and gas, and the actions that the Fed takes have a significant impact back home. So it's vital that uh, that we resist the demands to do that sort of thing now or in the future. And I very much appreciate that response. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts, the ranking member of the Digital Asset Subcommittee, Mr. Lynch, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for your willingness to come here and to, to update us. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, the Treasury Department announced that leaders from Treasury would begin to meet regularly with leaders from the Fed and, and from the White House uh, to discuss a possible CBDC, central bank digital currency, and other uh, payment innovations. In the statement, uh, it was mentioned, and I'll quote from it, it said that the Fed is encouraged to provide periodic public updates as it continues its research and its technical experimentation on central bank digital currencies. I was wondering, uh, first of all, when you might be expecting to uh, share some of these public updates, uh, what's the timing on that? So we did go out for, for comment uh, in general uh, on a CBDC a year or so ago, and I do expect we'll, we'll go out. I, don't, I can't give you a date, but we'll certainly go out and you know, engage. We, we, we engage with the public on an ongoing basis. Yeah. We are, we're also doing research on policy and also on technology. That's what we're up to. 
I'm aware of the, the Boston Fed has a partnership there, uh, the, the uh, Hamilton project over there with the folks from MIT uh, Media Lab, they're doing a great job. But, you know, it says here that the discussions would include uh, technical experimentation. I was just wondering at what level are you, are you talking about making decisions on architecture for a CBDC, a retail CBDC? We're not, we're not at the stage of making any real decisions. What we're doing is experimenting in kind of early stage experimentation. How would this work? Does it work? What's the best technology? What's the most efficient? We're really at an early stage on, but we're making progress on sort of technological issues. The, the policy issues are equally important though. You know, we haven't decided that this is something that the financial system in the country want or need. All right. So that's gonna be very important. Right. Well, I think I speak for the chairman as well. Uh, would love to have more dialogue with the Fed on, on that and maybe bring in the folks from MIT as well and just make sure that Congress and this committee is as up to date as, uh, as others. Uh, let me switch over to uh, Fed now. There are some <clears throat> champions of uh, digital currency and stable coins in particular that uh, continue to cite the need for faster payment systems. However, as uh, was earlier mentioned, the Fed now is a service that the Fed is working on to finalize that will allow for instant payments between <clears throat> bank accounts. And the Fed has a target release date of for Fed now uh, between May and July, which is right around the corner. Uh, do you see any reason why cryptocurrencies would provide faster payments than the Fed now system? Uh, and uh, would this offer with the transparency of Fed now, would it offer uh, distinct advantages over some of these stable coins that are uh, touting uh, faster payments? What Fed now will do is it will enable all the banks, any bank in the United States, not just the big ones, to offer instant, you know, instantly available funds and real-time payments to their customers. That's that's what it will do. So that's that's a great thing. You know, a CBDC. I think you're asking whether whether a CBDC would serve some of that, but a CD, CBDC is going to be years in the evaluation, and you know, uh, I think we can get this into the hands of the public very quickly, and I think we'll have real-time payments in this country very, very soon, and yeah. so that that's a good thing. It is. You know, I do have an overriding question, and that is, you know, before the greenback. Uh, everybody had their own currency. You know, you had rail, com rail companies, you had coal companies, you had, uh, you know, state banks that were authorized to issue their own currency. But, but when the greenback came out, uh, all of those various currencies went to zero because everyone had, you know, because the greenback had the full faith and credit of the United States behind it. I'm worried about a lot of these uh, stable coins and, and other cryptocurrencies uh, do they go to zero when, when we come up with a CBDC that has the full faith and credit of the United States behind it? That's, and we've got thousands of these out there, and you've got people investing millions and millions of dollars in the, well, trillions right now. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just thinking if we had those, those advantages built into a, uh, you know, a CDBC, wouldn't those alternatives go to zero if they did not have the transparency and the full faith and credit that, that we enjoy? So certainly unbacked cryptocurrencies that, that don't have any intrinsic value but nonetheless trade for a positive number, um, those, those have never understood the valuation of those. Stable coins are actually, many of them are really, they're, they're drawing on the credibility of the dollar. They have, they have dollar-based they're, they're dollar denominated mainly in the right. dollar based reserves, although we don't know what's in the reserves because there's no regulation. Gentleman's right. time has expired. The Thank gentleman you. from Missouri, Mr. Luke Meyer, is recognized for five minutes, the chair of the National Security Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and thank you, Chairman Fowle, for being here this morning. The reserve currency status of the dollar uh, to the U.S. has enormous financial and national security benefits. In the wake of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, the Fed took action to prevent the Kremlin from accessing more than $300 billion in reserves, roughly half of Ch uh, Russia's reserves. However, this led to an accelerated effort by countries like China to de-dollarize their official foreign exchange reserves. Just last week, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal titled, Russia Turns to the Yuan um, in an Effort to Ditch the Dollar. Not only that, but China's President Xi Jinping published <coughs> for the settlement of energy pushed for the settlement of energy trades in the Chinese Yuan 
at a summit with Arab leaders in December. <clears throat> the question is, um, are you concerned about these actions by Russia and China uh, to push, uh, to establish different reserves and conduct transactions in non-U.S. dollars? So the, uh, the U.S. dollar is the, the widely accepted and really the only serious candidate for, for the world's principal reserve currency. And that's, uh, that's because of our democratic institutions, our liquid markets, the rule of law, and all those kinds of things, and also the fact that the, the, the dollar has held its value over time. So other countries um, who are competing on other, other playing fields may wanna, they want to establish different currencies, but really the dollar is the one that's gonna be used more broadly in international commerce because we have those aspects and other countries don't. Well, that's true to now, but my question is, are you concerned about the actions of these countries uh, because if they, they see themselves being challenged or are concerned, for instance, if China would invade Taiwan, um, you know, as Russia invaded Ukraine, there were some sanctions put on. And I don't disagree with the sanctions. The last time you were here, though, Mr. Chairman, I asked the question, because it's an instructive moment for us, from the standpoint that knowing that we put sanctions and on, on Russia, all their different uh, accounts, as well as the oligarchs from that country, uh, are we thinking about doing the same thing to China when they invite, invade Taiwan? And your answer at that point was no. We passed a bill out of this, Congre out of this committee last week to ask the administration, basically, to, to start thinking about that in those terms. What kind of uh, situations can you come up with? Are you talking to allies, begin to talk to them, to start putting together a list of how you would go about sanctioning the, the different individuals, the different accounts, things like that. So have you started thinking about that at all yet? Well, let me say, the, the business of sanctions is entirely uh, in the hands of the elected government and the Treasury Department. We are, we are an implementer as it relates to banks, that's it. Yeah, we but you're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna take your advice on, on different different aspects of this, Mr. Chairman. Sorry? We're gonna take your advice on the different aspects of this. Well, I mean, honestly, when the sanctions were being put in place, Treasury was doing it, we weren't doing okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, All that's right. the way it works. Um, next question. Uh, there was an article, again, in one of the political newspapers this, yesterday, I guess it was, um, and it talked about the, uh, the problem that we have here with the Fed's balance sheet it says it now appears similar to, the, to a hedge fund whose long-term assets are financed by short-term borrowing. And the bottom line is that um, it's going to cost money. The Fed now has a negative income as a result of having to, to do this. And so it says here that the Fed will simply borrow the money uh, to pay the, the bills. Is, is this true? That we're having the Fed's losing money right now as a result of the way you've got your these, these, I think these the, debt, the borrowings that you've, you've purchased uh, structured? The, the place I would start is that, that the Fed has, you know, we, we always turn over all of our earnings in every year. We turn them over on an ongoing basis, and we've turned over something like $1.2 trillion in earnings just in the last, you know, decade or so. So uh, we always know that when, you know, when we, ra when we raise interest rates, okay. you're going to lose money. And okay. Of course but we you, agree with, you agree with the point that we have a negative income right now. And, That's and right. this makes my point to my next question, or my concern is, the CFPB gets their money. To Sorry. be able the CFPB gets their money to run their agency from the Fed. That's right. So basically there's no money for the Fed to pay the CFPB's bills if this is the case, unless you continue to borrow, which is basically what's going to happen now, is you're going to have to borrow money to be able to pay the, the CFPB's bills. Is that not correct? No, we don't, we don't borrow money. We, we, we issue, basically, yes, we, can, we, can, we don't shut down the Fed when we have negative income. Okay. We can pay our bills and we can so pay my the question, CFPB. Next question, my follow-up question then is, do you, have any, do you do any accountability or assessing of, of the CFPB's spending of these dollars at all? No, we don't. The, the so they just get a blank General check. Does. You just told me they just got a blank check. They send you a bill, you send them a check. There's no accountability there, for them. No, I think there are limits built into the law, which I don't have in the, in the, in the front of my head. I have yet to see a limit, Mr. Chairman. I'd love to see what the limits are because I don't think that they've ever agreed that they have that. But I see my time is up. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, this time has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Foster, the uh, ranking member of the Financial Institutions Monetary Policy Subcommittee. 
Uh, thank you, and just a, qu a quick comment. I, I think it's a mistake to imagine that you can completely hide from the macroeconomic effects of technology in your scenario planning. You know, if you, we just talk briefly about healthcare costs, you know, obesity, half of our healthcare costs, and there are treatments in the, these GLP-1 receptor agonists that, agonists that look like they're just a home run against obesity. And so these will be near-term impacts which, on, which will have make macroeconomic effects. So just, just a comment, I hope you have a certain fraction of futurists in the room when you're talking about your scenario planning, because a lot of that future is like now. Okay, back to economics. Um, so we have this historically low unemployment rate, you know, 3.4%. And historically, this would be considered to drive runaway inflation. You know, your predecessor, um, Alan Greenspan, repeatedly referred to dangerously low levels of unemployment. Um, and yet, we see inflation is coming down. Uh, so what is going on here? Uh, how can we have these historically low levels of unemployment without having inflation take off? Um, is it possible that we simply have less frictional unemployment in our system uh, due perhaps to the fact that people get their new jobs online and have a job lined up before they quit? So inflation is coming down, but it's very high is the thing. And some, some part, I've never said all of it or most of it, but some part of the high inflation that we're experiencing is very likely related to an extremely tight labor market. Wages affect prices, and prices affect wages. So I do think that's part of it. More, more to your point, though, there was a time when there was a tight relationship between inflation and um, unemployment. In other words, the Phillips curve was steep, and that went away over the period of the, of the great moderation. And really, in our thinking, that's because people came to expect 2% inflation, and we had 2% inflation, and then people just stopped focusing on inflation, and it stayed very low. So. There was really no relationship or very, very tiny relationship. We could have very weak economic growth or very strong economic growth, and we wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have inflation respond very much. That's, that, that was before the pandemic, though. Okay. Well, I, I hope you don't overlearn you know, some of the lessons there. It's one of my worries. that There have been a number of exogenous shocks to the system here, and it'll take a while to, to go through them, and if um, you want to be careful there. Now, in a related issue, um, you know, when you say refer to the totality of factors, you know, you're looking at a mixture of leading and lagging indicators when you look at this totality of factors. And my question is perhaps you might be paying too much attention uh, the to the lagging indicators and not enough to the leading indicators. You know, the example that's referenced, the reference in your marks and is in more detail in the, in the report, uh, about the difference between using current rental payments versus uh, versus the amount that you pay for a new rental contract in difference in how much they lag. Um, had you paid more attention, for example, to the leading indicators like current rental contracts, um, then you probably would have picked up uh, inflation earlier. You would have been, you know, not gotten so far behind the, the curve on that. Um, and secondly, there are policy implications going forward. If you look at current rental prices uh, for new contracts, we're much farther along in, in fixing inflation and that uh, you can you know, take your foot off the brake. And so what's your thinking on that and whether you may perhaps be systematically not paying enough attention to leading indicators versus lagging ones? So we've, we've, been, we've had our eyes on uh, the whole housing inflation thing from the very beginning. And I, you know, right now, what I would say is that um, uh, every forecaster is is baking in uh, higher, uh, low sorry lower rent increases. That's a big part of why people think inflation is going to come down in 2023. I think the thing with transitory was more, it more had to do with goods, and it had to do with the thought that that these supply side disruptions would go away much quicker than they would, that the labor market dis disruptions would go away much quicker than they did. And in, the hind you know, in hindsight, it just took much longer for, for those disturbances to go away. Yeah. So with hindsight, and if you, you know, allow yourself to Monday morning quarterback yourself, you probably would have gone up to 4% earlier um, and not had such a big problem with inflation. Um, and so what is your, um, you know, are there structural things you can contemplate or, or even uh, after, after action reviews to say what would have happened if we would have paid more attention to, uh, to the leading indicators or, or improve the band, in engineering term, improve the bandwidth of your feedback regulator. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> that, you know, this is, this is something, if you want to get the best result, you know, you need a high bandwidth feedback 
in, in the system, even when there's averaging on the back end. So th this is something we only think about during waking and sleeping hours, as you can imagine. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to know what the lessons are. Again, um, we, you know, we really thought things would, it, it, you, nobody had seen the supply chains collapse. No one had seen labor force participation plummet. We didn't know, or, or, or unemployment go to 14% and higher than that, really. Jones we didn't know times it would take to go away. And uh, I mean, if we ever see this pitch again, we'll know how to swing at it. But it's, well, it's been we'll now pretty, recognize pretty, the pretty bunch of firsts. Sorry. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman, uh, his time has expired. We'll now go to the gentlewoman from Missouri, the chair of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. I thank you, uh, Chairman McHenry. And Chair Powell, welcome. Uh, thank you for your service and for being here today. Uh, yesterday, I was pleased to hear you discuss how inflation is severely hurting the working people in America. In your testimony, you also state that strong wage growth is good for workers, but only if it is not eroded by inflation. And that is key. Inflation is a tax, a hidden tax on every American. If the Federal Reserve were to shirk its mandates to stabilize prices, <clears throat> leaving inflation alarmingly high, what would it cost America's hardworking families in Missouri's second congressional district and beyond? So I, I think the costs of failure to restore price stability would be extremely high. And while there will be costs to success, the, the costs of failure will be much higher. You'd be looking at an ex an extended period where people learn to expect and live with high and volatile inflation, and it's very, very hard to uh, to have rising real incomes during such a period. So it would be a bad thing for the country. Can you reassure the committee that the Fed remains committed to bringing prices down for our constituents? Yes, I do. Thank I you. I hereby assure you. As, in changing topics here a bit, as China's economy reopens and about 18% of the world's population resumes its consumption of oil and other key goods, what sort of inflationary impact will we see here in the United States, sir? So a stronger, a faster reopening of, of China, which we, we, it looks like we may be seeing, it does have the potential to put upward pressure on commodity prices, but it also would mean a faster sort of uh, unraveling of the, of the problems in supply chain. So those would be offsetting effects. I think sitting here today, we don't expect the net effect to be uh, big for the United States. It might be bigger for other parts of the world, but we, th we think it ought to be moderate overall. Well, China is one of the world's top oil importers. <clears throat> and do you expect any inflationary effects on global energy markets as China's oil consumption returns to their previous levels. So I think oil prices could be affected, um, and that, that's a, I think that's a big concern in, in Europe, for example. We have our own domestic oil, and we've got a lot of, of uh, natural gas as well. We sure do. I wish we were, were um, actually harvesting more of that liquid natural gas. Um, Chair Powell, you, Vice Chair Barr, and many others have recently identified that the banking system is well capitalized and strong. Bank capitalization remained robust during the shock of the pandemic and related shutdowns of economic activity. Capitalization of large financial institutions weathered severe stress testing mandated by the Fed. And despite all of that, as also previously mentioned by Chairman McHenry, Vice Chair Barr insists on conducting a, a review of capital rules. I'm concerned that this review is being conducted in a, in a silo and that the findings will not be made fully available to the public. Taking such an approach in the context of this holistic capital requirement review would make it impossible to conduct a transparent rulemaking process, denying the public information necessary to consider and to comment. I think this is just simply not, uh, not appropriate in this situation, and I'm concerned by the lack of, of, of clarity, I think is the best word, perhaps at this point, by the vice chair. Uh, a couple questions. You've served on the Fed board for over 10 years. 
since the financial crisis regulatory framework has been put in place. And over that period, have you seen any real world evidence that America's banks are undercapitalized? So American banks are strongly capitalized, and I, I believe uh, Vice Chair Barr has, has said that as well. But uh, yes. he, the point is he hasn't, there haven't been any real proposals to evaluate yet. And when there are, that will be done in a, in a highly transparent manner. I hope so. I'm glad to hear you say in a highly transparent matter. Do you agree that excessively high capital levels constrain banks' lending capacity with spillover effects on jobs and living standards for Americans? So I, I think it's always a balance, right? High, more capital means more safety and soundness and more ability to withstand terribly stressful periods. But it also, you know, it's, it, it's more expensive. Equity capital is more expensive. U.S. banks have competed incredibly well around the world. Yes, they have. High levels internationally. Of but, so that's a trade-off that you, uh, you, you're always going to be making when you think about capital. My time has expired. expired. We'll, yes, thank we'll you. We'll now Thank recognize you. the gentlewoman, uh, gentlewoman from Ohio, the chair, uh, I'm sorry, the ranking member of the National Security Subcommittee, uh, Ms. Beatty. Ms. Beatty, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I like that uh, title. Uh, to the, uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for uh, coming and being such a good colleague and friend. I have a couple questions I'm going to try to get uh, through quickly. Uh, Chair Powell, in a press conference last month, you stated, quote, there is a lot of spending coming into the construction pipeline, both private and public, and so that's going to support economic activity, end of quote. How do you think the strong pipeline of funding uh, from what the Democrats put together in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, and the CHIPS Science Act uh, will do to um, have economic activity this year and moving forward. So I, I guess I was making the point that there are a lot of sources of demand that, that we can rely on, even though um, demand has been relatively uh, increasing at a relatively modest modest rate. Part of it is- Will this help in that demand? Yes, I mean, there, there is state and local governments I mentioned are, are about- So would you say this is a, a great thing that uh, we've done uh, coming from the left not, over not here? For me to, not for me to judge uh, the merits of, of what gets done, but I'm just saying there's- But demand, it will contribute. There that will support economic- And support activity. it. Yeah. So I'm gonna assume from that that that's a positive. Let me go to the second uh, question. Uh, Chairman Powell, the Federal Open Markets Committee is projecting that unemployment will increase to 4.6% by the end of the year. And those costs, as we know, won't be bore equally. If we look at the ratio from the last time unemployment was 4.6% and compare it to our numbers now, it would mean that white unemployment would go up to about 0 0.9, but black unemployment would go up by 2.3%. Uh, does that sound somewhat accurate to you? Yes. Uh, can you uh, address the disparity impact with that? And before you answer, let me go to the book and thank you that you that was put at our places together. Uh, you made it in this book with your signature on it is stated. However, while disparities in unemployment have largely returned to pre-pandemic levels, there still remain significant disparities in absolute levels of employment uh, across groups like African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, so can you address that? I, I can. So right now, to your point, um, actually, uh, African American unemployment is, I think, four five point four percent, which is just about as it's low as low as it's been since we started tracking it in 1972. But differential from majority we'll by. I'm going to say the diff So that's five point four, whereas the overall is three point four, and that includes blacks. So that means for whites, whites is well lower than that. What happens is so there's a there's a persistent gap between black and white unemployment and. Also, when, when unemployment goes up quickly in a recession, it goes up much faster for African Americans. When the economy grows again, it comes down faster. So that's just, that, that's somehow embedded in our economy. We don't really have, the, the, the best thing we can do is, is achieve stable prices so that we can have long, long expansions. And what happens in those long expansions is that the labor market gets tight, sustainably tight. And we have we have you know historic lows in in unemployment, including for African Americans. 
Let me say thank you, and let me also uh, again thank you. As you know, in the 117th, I was the chair of the DNI committee, and let the record state that you always pushed for making sure that you understood and respected that. And, and in that, this is very minor and certainly personal to me. In this report, maybe those who helped you author it, uh, I would like to see uh, the areas that talks about unemployment not under a title of special topics but something that draws a little more attention to it as some of the others, just very minor. Last question I have. Uh, can you tell me if the feds is committed to working with the other agencies like the FDIC and the OCC uh, to finalize a rule soon on CRA? Uh, certainly that's something of great interest to many of my colleagues. So can you give us any updates on it or how the process is going or what we can expect? Yes, so, so uh, with, with uh, Governor Brainerd's departure for the White House, I've asked uh, Vice Chair Barr to take the lead in, in uh, moving it forward. There's a, I would characterize it that there's a, essentially agreement between the three banking agencies on, uh, on the changes to be made. That's all being written up and vetted. And at a certain point, it, uh, boards, members of the Board of Governor will be, br will be briefed on it, will vote on it. Is there anything we can do uh, to help with that? No, I, th I think we're we're hard at work on it, and we're it's going to take some months, but I think we're we're nearing the uh, we can see the the, the the airport and we'll be landing in a few. General, the time's expired. Thank the gentleman you. from back. Kentucky, the uh, chair of the Financial Institutions and Monetary Policy Subcommittee, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman McHenry and uh, Chairman Powell. Economic data are mixed, as you know. On the one hand, low unemployment, robust hiring strong consumer spending, and persistent core inflation, and a CPI that's still more than three times your 2% target suggests more aggressive tightening is warranted. On the other hand, because the Fed misjudged the inflationary impact of Democrats' overspending, kept interest rates too low for far too long, and failed to end quantitative easing soon enough, the Fed has been forced to raise the Fed funds rate 450 basis points in just 11 months and reduce the M2 money supply at the fastest rate since the 1930s. As a result, wage gains have slowed, credit card debt is at an all-time high, the housing market is in a slump, and the yield curve is inverted. I agree with you that the historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy, but what would you say to those who caution about the lag effects of monetary policy? The, de the precipitous decline in liquidity. <clears throat> Will the economy have to suffer a recession in order to bring inflation down to 2%? We, we are very well aware of uh, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation. Those are long and variable, and I would stress highly uncertain. There is really no agreement on exactly how long they are, but we know that slowing down the pace of rate hikes this year is a way for us to see more of those effects as, the, as they come in. In December, most Fed officials expected to lift rates this year to between 5 and 5.5%. Five and is that still your estimated terminal rate, uh, or does uh, the data suggest uh, that the terminal rate could be higher than 5.5%? My colleagues and I will write down new forecasts uh, and release them to the public on March 22, but as I as I mentioned in my testimony, the data we've seen so far uh, this year suggests that the ultimate level of rates will need to be higher. But we, we still have some more data to come in between now and the meeting. But as of today, it suggests a higher level than that. Let's go to Vice Chairman Barr's uh, <clears throat> review of the capital framework. A lot of questions uh, for you on that. When Governors Brainerd, Quarles, Clarida, Bowman, and Waller made up the board under your leadership, major changes in policy were addressed following board consensus and not when there was significant dissent. Will you commit to not implementing a new capital framework following this holistic review or the Basel endgame if there is considerable dissent from the board? I, I can't really commit to that, you know. I, uh, I, I, we are a consensus kind of an organization and that's what we'll work toward. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, we, we would would that be a break from your prior practices? You're a consensus builder, Mr. Chairman. You, you pride yourself in that, and we credit you for being a consensus-oriented chairman. Will you commit to continuing that practice and not allow 
major changes to the capital, bank capital regulatory framework to be made by one person? Well, they can't be made by any one person, but uh, I do commit to that, and I commit to, to doing everything I possibly can to bring people together in consensus, something to have something that, that, that can be broadly supported. Thank you. Earlier this year, you said, and I quote, we are not and will not be a climate policy maker. However, the Fed's, in the Fed's draft principles on climate-related financial risks, one proposed principle suggested that boards of directors or of a financial institution should consider making changes to its compensation policies to align with values in the context of supposed climate risks. It appears, then, that the Federal Reserve, through regulation, wants to begin implementing climate policies. So which is it? There seems to be a disconnect between your statements publicly and the rules that the board is putting forward for comment. Well, I, uh, I feel strongly that climate change is an important issue that needs to be addressed by elected people. Uh, it's, it's about, it's just not something that we've been charged with by Congress, clearly. Uh, so we, we do have a narrow role, and that role will be around making sure that banks understand and can manage the risks that they're running, and that's going to be it. And, I, and I, 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 as I said before, there's, you know, we, we don't want to drift into becoming a climate yeah. policymaker, and we'll have to guard that border very carefully. Re re regarding the Fed's climate scenario analysis pilot program, did the board vote to approve the creation of that pilot program? I have to check, but I don't think so. I think it's, it was already authorized. And this is a concern that I have. I'm concerned that one governor acting unilaterally to implement major policy changes without board consensus is a problem. Uh, and so I would urge you and your colleagues on the board uh, to continue a consensus-oriented approach. And I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Mr. Himes of Connecticut, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Chairman Powell. Um, thank you for your careful conduct of monetary policy, independent of the many political desires that circulate in this building. Um, independent monetary policy is a bedrock of a, of a solid economy. Um, I want to reflect for a moment on another bedrock of the American economy, the full faith and credit of the United States government, which is now being put at risk by the Republican majority. My Republican friends know how very dangerous a game they are playing. They know that salary payments to our soldiers are at risk. They know that their irresponsibility will raise mortgage rates for new home buyers. But they say this is the only time we focus on spending in the debt, which of course is baloney. It's a pernicious form of baloney. The time to focus on the deficit is when you are voting for the spending and the tax cuts that create the deficit. When you're voting for the Trump, the Trump tax cuts, which the CBO said would add $2 trillion to the national debt, that's the moment to consider whether you want to do that. Not when the good name of the United States is hanging in the balance. This stuff gets a little complicated, but the American people really need to understand what's happening here. The Congress sits down to a huge 10-course meal of tax cuts and spending and more defense spending and expansion of this program and stimulus, all of which we vote for collectively. <clears throat> First course, second course, white wine, red wine, four servings of dessert. And then the bill comes and my Republicans say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, look at this bill. This is irresponsible. Do we really want to pay this bill? That's not the moment for the consideration. The moment is when you're ordering four helpings of dessert. That's when we should be talking about it and taking responsibility for the choices that we make without putting the full faith and credit of the United States at risk. Now, now here's where the hypocrisy comes in. My Republican friends like to point the finger at this side of the aisle and blame us. The chairman, as you know, fully one quarter, 25% of today's United States debt was accrued in the four years of the Trump administration. This country's been around for 246 years, and fully one quarter of the United States debt was accrued under President Trump. By the way, speaking of hypocrisy, in the four years of President Trump, the debt ceiling was raised or suspended three times. I didn't even notice. But now, of course, we have a different president, and so the calculus is different. Now, Mr. Chairman, I don't think I'm gonna persuade the majority to act responsibly here. I actually think the markets will persuade them. And you'll recall, because we were watching this closely, September 29th, 2008, the Republican House of Representatives voted down the Great Recession Rescue Package. As the vote was going down in the House of Representatives, the equity market dropped 7%. $1.2 trillion lost 
in people's retirement accounts. Now, Congress sobered up, and a couple days later, we passed the Rescue Act. So, Mr. Chairman, there is a question here, and the question is this. You and I both watch the markets pretty closely. Treasury tells us that on June 5th, that's just three months away, on June 5th, the Treasury runs out of money. So my question to you, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm asking you to be a little speculative here, but what should we watch for? What market signals could indicate that the markets are getting fed up with the manifest irresponsibility around this? Get, get, give, give us some things that we should be looking for. And I'd love to, but I'm going to limit myself to what other Fed chairs have said about the debt ceiling, which is that it, it does need to be ra raised by Congress in the end. There are no other, no rabbits in hats, as I mentioned. And also that no one should assume that we, the Fed, this is the Fed's business, is to protect the economy from various events. And, and you know, I wouldn't assume, no one should assume that we have the tools to protect uh, the highly uncertain effects of, of that kind of an event. So, so monetary policy is obviously very concerned with interest rates. If global capital markets begin to decide that we're really serious about hurting ourselves this time, is it possible that we could see interest rates rise more because borrowers of United States debt decide that we're actually a little risky? Is that possible? I, I think that and many other things are possible. The thing is, we've never crossed that line, and, and uh, we, if we cross that line, we're going to find out, and we, I think it's highly uncertain. Okay, so that's possible, and, 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 and I, you know I don't like pressing you on these things, but you said this and many other things are possible. You want to elaborate on what might be in the category of many other things? Rather not, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I figured. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Powell, again. I, I really thank you uh, for your really responsible conduct of monetary policy. And there's a reason that you are insulated from our political desires, and I very much appreciate that and yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll now recognize the chair of the Small Business Committee, Mr. Roger Williams of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chairman, it's good to see you. Always good to have you here. Uh, in past congressional testimonies, you've repeatedly stated that you support protecting the state-based system of insurance regulation, which is the most effective and competitive in the world. In my home state of Texas uh, is the world's seventh largest insurance market, proving the success of this system. Now at the International Association for Insurance Supervisors Conference, in November, there is the opportunity to have the U.S. state-based aggregation method become formally recognized as comparable or equivalent to the insurance capital standard. We should not be following the European model that has increased regulations and less competition, and we should prioritize a model that encourages deregulation, competition, and less government uh, involvement in pricing. So my question is, Chairman, can you highlight the benefits of the U.S. state-based aggregation method compared to the European model regarding market resiliency and systematic risk, and uh, can you confirm that you will push for aggregation method to be deemed equivalent by the IAIS? I, I can say this. I, I do think that our insurance regulatory system has proved itself appropriate and adequate and gotten the job done for a long time, and we don't need to be copying other countries uh, or other regions insurance regulatory system on right. I, I'm a little rusty on the on the details of the capital requirements but uh, that sounds right but our uh, bottom line is our side works the other doesn't we need to stay where we are our side works yeah thank you uh, also in the past you stated that banks were well capitalized we've talked about that today and but now there have been increased conversations about raising capital requirements uh, numerous economic studies have found that raising capital requirements, for banks will increase borrowing costs for their consumer and commercial customers. And I'm somebody that's owned uh, 50 years. I've never had a day I wasn't out of debt, so I'm concerned about this. And implementing additional regulatory capital requirements will slow economic growth and limit financial institutions' lending ability. So do you believe that raising capital uh, requirements would raise the cost of borrowing and add cost to our economy in Main Street America? Well, I, it depends on which banks uh, experience higher capital requirements, and there isn't any proposal to evaluate right now, of course, but um, it's always a trade-off. You know, higher capital is good in, in a sense because it keeps banks able to lend during bad times. That's really a good thing. Too much capital, though, probably limits credit availability, so we're trying to strike that balance always. Uh, and this has been touched on a little today, but let me come from a different angle on it, but the reserve was created to act as a nonpartisan entity that remains separate from party politics. We talked about that, and unfortunately, throughout recent years, the Fed has gotten caught up in politically charged issues like economic inequality, 
gender and race discrimination, and climate change. Recently, the Federal Reserve Board proposed guidance on managing climate-related risks for large banks, further proving that the Fed is giving in to some political pressure and operating outside its intended purpose and responsibilities. So our country's uh, financial leaders, uh, in, in my mind, should be focusing on addressing runaway inflation uh, instead of worrying what about the financial institutions are doing to monitor climate change. So, and we touched on this a little bit, but how can the Fed ensure that they're not placing undue regulations and guidance on banks by forcing involvement in partisan uh, green politics? And how's the Federal Reserve ensuring they remain separate from political influence? I think it's absolutely critical that we do. I mean, our, our independence is, is partly founded on the idea that we will stay out of, of stuff that you have not assigned us to do. And if we're going to wander all over and take on the hot issue of the day, our case for our independence is, is dramatically weakened. On, on climate change, um, I think we do, the, you mentioned the guidance, and then there are also the stress scenarios, and those are the two things that, that, we, that we've done. We've tried to keep those tightly focused on, on, on the bank's uh, you know, understanding and being able to manage the risks that they'll run over the longer, over the longer time periods uh, on climate and not slide into you know, a, a broader sort of policy-making role on climate change. And, I, I accept that that could be a slippery slope and, and, and a, a, a moving border. And I just want to say, and my, I think my colleagues feel the same way uh, on the board, that we, we, we're going to guard that border carefully and we're going to stick to our role and not try to be policymakers the way in, in, in many other countries the central bank is out there in the lead with the support of the public doing uh, climate policy. But that's not, that's not where we are in the United States and, and we're not going to pretend that it is. I've got some time left, and I'll yield back, but I just want to say as an auto dealer, I'm looking for the first day of that rate cut. Done with that. <laughs> so, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Chairman Powell, a uh, pleasure to see you again. I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's always great to see you because I always think of the old Republicans the, the ones who are very noble, did the right thing, didn't play chicken with the economy, um, very forthright. And so anyway, I appreciate you being here very much. Like some of my colleagues on the other side, I'd say the same thing about some of them. And I appreciate you. Um, so we heard today that the inflation is Biden's fault. So what is the inflation rate in the European Union today? It's high. It's high. Is it? 10% possibly? I think if you're talking about headline, I don't have this figure in my head, but it's very, very high from a headline standpoint. Yeah. And they've, they've had core inflation move up too. Yeah. So are they following Biden's then uh, policies? Is that what caused the inflation? Because it seems to be Biden's fault. So I think inflation is everywhere, and it, has to, it must have to do with a common factor, and that common factor has to be the reopening of the economy after and the things that were done on um, uh, on COVID. On the other hand, each country has a little bit different case, and I think uh, you have to be careful. We had, we had much more of a demand-oriented issue than they did. Now they have. Their, their, their inflation looks a lot like ours did a year ago. Right. Yeah, I, I, I just had to bring it up because, again, uh, Mr. Sherman brought it up, but it's interesting. Every time I hear inflation is caused by Biden, I wonder why is it all over the world? I mean, it's not because of the pandemic, of course, or you know, Europe's at war. I mean, that wouldn't cause it, of course. It'd have to be Biden's policies. Um, that's ridiculous. And I think the voters saw through it last time. So I haven't been here 15 years as my good friend, Mr. Foster. I've only been here 11. But when I first got here, the boogeyman, and I heard it all from my friends on the other side, was Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was going to be the end of banking. And in fact, some of my colleagues would almost scream how horrible this was. And then we had got the bankers up here during a real stress test, which was the pandemic. And we asked them, has it been helpful to have Dodd-Frank? Do you know what they said? Do you know what they said? I don't. Oh, they said it was helpful. In fact, it kept the banks capitalized. It was, it was fascinating. Now, to be fair to them, they did complain about some of the smaller issues, but not Dodd-Frank in general, the bill. Then it seemed that CFPB, that became the next boogeyman. But they're starting to seem to fade on that, and I think the reason for that is the CFPB has actually helped so many people, and now a lot of their own constituents now are getting help by the CFPB, so all of a sudden, there's not quite the energy. So now, they're attacking ESG. 
ESG. And they're saying that you uh, and everybody else is somehow conspiring to make sure they don't buy their oil or their coal. Um, are you conspiring to do that? Are you conspiring? Not, I don't believe we're conspiring. No. Now, I heard it was supposed climate risk. Is there risk in the climate change? Yes. There is? Could it affect the bank? Certainly, in the, in the longer run, yes. Yeah, of course it can. Do you think insurance companies take this into account? I, yes, actually, I believe they do. They, they absolutely do. Who write long-lived, long long-duration liabilities, they certainly do. Of course they do. I mean, they're very concerned with it. Uh, weather is a big deal. Um, I was a vice president of uh, Liberty Mutual in their corporate legal department, and I can tell you weather and the changing of the weather, we used to have what we call catastrophes. And these catastrophes happen every 25 50, 100 years. Now those 25, 50, and 100 year events happen every five years, every two years. So of course it is. I mean, it, it's ridiculous not to take a look at these ESG factors. We have to. And, and again, I'm glad that you guys are taking a look at it because it's real. I'm glad that you know, the, the president's taking a look at it. And, and it's sad that my colleagues on the other side just want to stick their head in the sand and say, no, uh, climate change is supposed climate change. No, the reality is it's real climate change, and it's costing billions and billions of dollars, and if you don't believe it, go ask all those poor people in Florida that had those huge hurricanes come through and wipe them out. So again, I appreciate very much the work that you've done. The only thing I hope is, as you said, if we ever see this pitch again, we'll know how to swing at it, and I hope we don't get the pitch of defaulting, because I'm not sure we'll know how to swing at that one. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time, uh, he, gentleman yields back. Gentleman's time has expired. We'll now go to the chair of the oversight subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to move uh, quickly, and good to see you again, Chair. Um, you know, I uh, I caught a little bit of the Senate hearings yesterday, and um, you had a lot of pressure uh, to keep the sugar high going. And frankly, if the Fed and many of our colleagues uh, had listened to what many of us were saying. Uh, we should have been weaned off that artificially low, cheap money that kept the party going, and frankly, we wouldn't be in this position. Um, to reference Chair Greenspan's punch bowl analogy, not only did no one have the courage to remove the punch bowl, uh, you had people cheering on the pouring of another bottle of 151 rum into the punch bowl. And here you got folks wanting to do the exact same thing. Let's spend more. Um, it's just, it, it, and now here we are, you have an impossible decision uh, to slow the economy or let everyone get crushed by inflation. And we know tightening means a slower economy, slower economy means fewer jobs, fewer jobs hit those who can least afford to lose a job. And so in short, the lower rungs of the economic ladder will suffer more than the rest of the ladder. So. That's the, stay, uh, that's, that's the state of play of where we're at. Um, I have to hit a couple of quick issues here. Um, I wanted to start off by discussing climate, especially given the Fed's announcement in January that it was going to conduct a pilot climate scenario analysis exercise. Uh, the Fed, along with the OCC and FDIC, have each issued proposed climate risk management principles for banks that you are attempting to finalize those by the end of the year, and the requirements don't stop at the border. The UK and the EU central banks are moving to require significant ESG disclosure regimes as well. I know the Fed is taking a look at commodities capital charges in the holistic review, but even though the Fed isn't forcing banks to encompass climate analysis in their stress tests, there are many initiatives at the Fed that are going to make it more costly for banks to finance traditional fossil fuel companies. Uh, so I want to ask you a very specific question. Will you commit that you will withhold support for a new capital rule that increases capital charges on bank activities in traditional energy companies? You know, I, 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 can't, I can't sit here and promise what I will and not, will and will not vote for because I, I don't know what's going to be in the proposal, but that, that's, that's not the kind of thing I think we're looking at. I'm sorry, it's not the kind of thing? So th this isn't about, uh, you know, this is about overall capital levels more than anything else, I think, rather than the specific thing you're talking about. Okay. Um, we're going to follow up on that uh, because we need to have a real-time uh, conversation about what that is going on there. Uh, I want to quickly switch topics and go in a different direction for this next question. Uh, I want to ask you about two opinions issued by your legal staff in November of 
2019 and December of 2020 to the asset managers Vanguard and BlackRock. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, McHenry, I'd like to uh, submit the uh, two letters for the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, these opinions appear uh, to be uh, to outline the parameters of both how how both Vanguard and BlackRock can operate without being deemed a bank holding company. Uh, in addition to the legal restrictions outlined by the bank holding company, these opinions listed out here in quite detail uh, uh, list out commitments that the companies would need to take to avoid being viewed as having quote control. Uh, these opinions also appear to provide assurances that the Federal Reserve Board staff would not recommend that the board find the asset managers to be bank holding companies. Further, it is unclear whether the board will take any steps beyond a periodic self-certification by the asset managers to monitor compliance with the condition that they, quote, not take any action to control a banking organization. As some asset managers play a larger role and clearly strive to influence policy, uh, in companies across the free market, we need to remain vigilant. So Chair Powell, is the board taking any steps to assess or monitor whether Vanguard and BlackRock are complying with the commitments made in November of 2019 and December of 2020, respectively? I would have to check and get back to you on that. Okay. I'm familiar uh, with, familiar that, with I, I appreciate that, um, but that says to me that it doesn't sound like there's an assessment that's taking place ongoing. Um, or scrutiny of that? Is somebody reviewing that or is someone in charge of reviewing that? Honestly, I, you know, that's a very specific, narrow question. I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the well, issue. Well, it's, it's, it's specific and narrow to two companies, yeah. but not to an industry. I mean, that's, that's what we need to be driving at. Um, and I, I guess that's, we need to find out whether there's somebody proactively reviewing these activities and these commitments that the companies have made as well as the Fed has made. So um, how often do you think they should be reassessed? Annually, monthly, biannually? You know, th this, is a, this is a very narrow uh, set of questions. I can, I can get you great answers really easily, but I don't have them in my head. Today. I look forward to those expired. great answers, and I yield We'll back. now uh, go to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Godheimer, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Powell, for joining us today. Chairman Powell, when you testified before the committee last June, PC inflation was up 6.3% year over year. Just a few weeks ago, PC data showed that number of, the numbers decreased to 5.4%. We're moving in the right direction, but despite the Federal Reserve raising interest rates at the highest rate since October 2007, we're still far off from the 2% inflation that the Federal Reserve is targeting. Uh, do you believe 2% is still the right target for inflation? And given the ongoing energy transition, the push to shift supply chains out of China, and the labor shortage here in the U.S., should the Fed consider adjusting its target to avoid overly burdening Americans? Would a decline to 3% inflation be enough to offer price stability without excessive economic pain? No, 2% inflation is going to remain our longer-term inflation goal. Are you concerned given all the other factors that I mentioned, or do you think we just have to keep sticking with that? I think that's got to remain our, our longer-term inflation goal. It's the, it's the global standard, and it's our standard, and, and this is not a time at which we can, we can start talking about changing it. We have no instinct to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gig economy has grown significantly in recent years as more Americans are working as contractors or running small businesses. The Dallas Federal Reserve has written that gig workers are often not included in payrolls and not counted among the unemployed, and this may understate the number of Americans who could be counted as unemployed. The Fed has also noted the large number of Americans who are missing from the workforce after the pand pandemic. Do, do we need to change the way we think about measuring unemployment to account for these changes? I, I missed the word you're saying. Gate Sorry, do you think we need to change the way we think about measuring unemployment to account for these changes? I, I didn't catch this. You said, what was gig. the word? Gig. Oh, sorry, gig. Uh, you know, gig, gig workers. workers. Gig yeah, so I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't, gig I didn't workers. That. That's the word I didn't hear. Okay. No, we, we, we clearly need to incorporate gig workers both into the, la or the labor force and to whether they're working. And they, are, they certainly are working. We try to do that. It's not that we're not trying to do that. We may not be doing it perfectly. Is there a better way to capture it? I'm just worried that you don't have the unemployment numbers may not given we're still using older measurement ways, are we, are we updating our measurement? We, we absolutely try. We, we, we're definitely trying to get those people, self-employed people. They do, they, they do report in the, in the household survey, I believe. Um, I can get more for you on that, but That'd I'm be sure great. we're not doing a perfect job at it because it's a relatively new thing, but we're very well aware of it, and they're, you know, they're supposed to be included. That would be great. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Great. Thank you. Uh, as, you, as you're also aware, many of us are having discussions about the long-term fiscal health of our country and our economy. 
Uh, like many, I worry that higher interest rates will put upward pressure on the national debt. CBO already estimates that annual interest costs will nearly triple for the U.S. over the next decade. You said to the Senate yesterday that interest payments are not a consideration of the Fed, but, but are you concerned that higher interest rates will more rapidly make payments on the debt unsustainable? And are there actions Congress should consider to address this issue? So I'll, I'll say what my predecessors have said, which is that we're on an unsustainable path and, and we really need to. Ultimately, we will get back on a sustainable path, and the sooner we get to work on that, the less painful it will be. Um, and, and rates, of course, were low between the financial crisis and the end of 2021, particularly low uh, after the target inflation rates hit. What do you think the new normal looks like in terms of rates and the Fed balance sheet over the next uh, five to 10 years? You know, it's a really good question. You, you, there was a secular decline in longer term interest rates, which we don't control, for 40 years to, to the point where they were, you know, where the, the 10 year was, was a 10 year treasury was at was 10 percent. And then at the end of 40 years, it was quite low. You're at higher levels. You're at, as you pointed out, levels we haven't seen since since earlier in this century. I don't think anybody knows what this is going to look like uh, five years down the road. It, 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 so you have to ask. Uh, demographics haven't gotten better. Globalization may actually um, move a little bit in reverse, which would tend to produce higher inflation and thus higher rates. But you have to ask the factors that caused low rates. How much of that has changed? And some of it has, but much of it hasn't. Building on that a little bit, what's the right metric you think for, if you in our shoes, for assessing our fiscal health? Do you think we should be focused on maintaining a specific debt to GDP ratio, or is there a specific number? Are there other measures lawmakers should be focusing on? So we, we've traditionally focused on debt to GDP, but many people pointed out before the pandemic that rates were secularly lower and that therefore you could look at sort of real debt service. Uh, and in, there was a lot of research on that. And by, by those measures, actually, debt service was much more easy, easy to handle. Now we have the 10 years back close to 4%. And I think you know, we're, we're, you know, we, need to be, we need to be careful not to assume that these secularly low, longer term rates are going to continue indefinitely, because that doesn't look likely now. And, and fr frankly, most forecasts have always shown things like the 10-year going back to a higher level. So it's, it won't be that big of a change. I think, I think it's more or less been handled for example, by CBO that way. Excellent. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you. Thanks. Now I'll go to the gentleman, uh, the vice chair of the Digital Assets Subcommittee, and the chair of the uh, Housing Subcommittee, Mr. Davidson of Ohio, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you. It's uh, an honor to be able to talk with you today and appreciate uh, the work you and the monetary, focused, monetary policy focused portion of the Fed does. Uh, we're rooting for, for uh, maybe a more consistent input from our uh, bank regulators. So for the regulatory side, I've spoken with multiple bankers who tell me that they've never seen a higher degree of regulatory burden, uh, steering, guidance, shaping uh, activities in the market from regulators. And I don't think that's just narrowly focused on the Fed, um, but I'd ask you to look into it. I know a lot of people that feel like there's an Operation Choke Point 2.0 going on and it's particularly focused on debanking people that are disfavored by you know, the current uh, executive branch primarily, uh, just like the previous Operation Choke Point was. And uh, so to the extent that uh, you yield any influence over the regulatory component of the Federal Reserve, I think that would be meaningful and important because you know, our monetary system, part of the strength of the US dollar is of course a stable store of value. Uh, currencies around the world are wrestling with that and inflation, and you guys are working to tackle it. Uh, but the other part is, is it's an efficient means of an exchange. And when people uh, really feel like some third party is going to steer or shape their money, they don't trust it. I mean, the unbanked and the underbanked, fundamentally, that's lack of trust is part of why they don't use our banking system today. In fact, that's part of the appeal of the digital asset space. Uh, is the permissionless nature of it. Um, it seems that a lot of people uh, in the, in the uh, financial services space that have grown up in it, that are uh, leading it today, um, feel threatened by the prospect of change. Um, and if, they, if they've maybe reluctantly concluded that you can't ban crypto, they at least want to keep it account-based so that some third party can actually control the assets, which is a polite way of saying we don't actually trust our citizens to control their money or their assets. We'll let somebody else do it for them because we can control those third parties. Uh, and in fact, that's what the regulators do, isn't it? 
is in what? They control the third parties. I mean, if you don't comply with the regulatory regime, you don't get to operate a financial services business, right? That's right. Yeah. And so uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think a lot of people were concerned by your remarks yesterday. I know I was by saying that permissionless uh, digital assets pose a systemic risk to the financial system. Well, what I think uh, what we said in our guidance, I, th I think if you, by the way, I think if you read through the digital guidance, which I did getting ready for this hearing, of course I read it before we put it out the first time, but it's pretty careful to say that we don't want regulation to, to oppose innovation and thus entrench incumbents and things like that. It's pretty balanced, the language, and I, I think it, it essentially goes to the question of, of protecting the safety and soundness of institutions. And there is one, you, you, what, I think what we say about, I'll paraphrase it, what we say about permissionless block changes is, is that they have been vehicles for fraud. Yeah, 0.24 percent. So if you follow the, your own report yeah. on, on fraud, uh, it's a fraction of what it is with the U.S. dollar. Speaking of the dollar, is there any real current threat to the dollar's uh, preeminence as the world's reserve currency? You say, you're asking a question. I didn't. Yes, sir. Is there a real threat? threat? Is there a threat? Uh, I think that our our status as the world's reserve currency is is not is 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 not under particularly strong threat right now. Uh, I think it's a it's a pretty stable equilibrium. It's not a permanent equilibrium, but there isn't really a serious competitor, and that's not because of any of this. It's because of our our democratic institutions and the rule of law and the fact that we that we that the dollar's value is is uh, pretty stable. Okay. Um, so quickly on the repo market, just any insight into that, and then I'll have my last comment here and just leave the last word to you. But particularly curious about the repo market. But I'll close by simply saying I'd ask you to turn off the purchase of mortgage-backed securities. As the chairman of housing and insurance, I'm particularly concerned about affordable housing. And uh, the artificial prop for the mortgage-backed securities uh, does raise the cost of capital in that space. So whether you own it or occupy it or rent it, it's going to raise the, the cost there. But I'd just ask if you'd comment on the, the safety and soundness of the repo market, if you would. Of the repo market. Um, I, as far as I know, the repo market is functioning reasonably well these days. Are you talking about the reverse repo facility? Or yes. The Reverse repo facilities is a different thing. We can we can continue this. I'd like to follow up with you later, and uh, my time has expired. I yield. Thanks, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Cassins, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Always a pleasure to see you, and uh, appreciate your time here today. Um, the I want to uh, I want to start with uh, this this chart in your monetary policy report, which I think is fascinating. Chart 14 on page 17. This is this history of uh, wage growth and job growth. And for those of you who are, don't have it in front of you, broadly speaking, from 2000 to 2017, we had more workers than jobs. Um, from 17 until the COVID crisis, it was about the same. And since COVID, um, we've had more, more jobs than workers. And there's tons of rich stuff in here that I just enjoyed reading. But, but broadly speaking, if, I, if, if that was the only thing going on in the economy, I would assume that we had 20 years where it was essentially a buyer's market for labor and, and the last year and a half where it's been a seller's market for labor um, as you look at that. And if I go through and I look at from 2010 to 2020, CPI was up 20% over the period um, and real median wage is less than 10%. Um, so for half of the economy, they didn't keep up with wages, even though we think of that as a very low inflationary period. Corporate profits were also up strongly, as, as you would expect. I'm not saying that with judgment, right? If it's a buyer's market for labor, you would expect the gains from labor productivity to flow to consumers and profits, and that looks like what it did. In the, Wait, which chart are you looking at? This is uh, uh, chart 14 on page 17 of the monitor. It's the top right corner there. Um, Got it. Okay, thanks. The... In the last year and a half, um, median wages are up 5%, which is almost as much as they grew during that 10-year that period before. And yes, inflation is still a bit higher than that. But what I'm wondering is, as you look at the economy, is wage growth universally bad in your view, or is wage growth good to the extent that it's keeping up with wages? Because historically, wages didn't keep up. and and. How do you think through that nuance? Because interest rates are a very blunt tool. 
And, you know, and if we are now, if you agree with me that we're now basically in a seller's market for labor, shouldn't we expect and welcome some wage inflation that goes with that? So I'd say, I'd say two things. First, we, we want wages to go up uh, in ways that are consistent with the, over time, consistent over time with the increase in productivity and inflation. And uh, that, that, makes, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, the other thing I would say is that in this instance, what we've seen is, is inflation eating up these, these very high nominal wage gains have very largely been eaten up by higher inflation. So it's very important that we restore price stability so that we can start to see real wage gains, real wage gains after inflation across the income spectrum. Yeah, no, and, and, and to be clear, like, I, you know, we're all opposed to inflation here, but in, in that 2010 to 2020 period that we all viewed as a very low inflationary period, wages, the gains from productivity did not flow to labor. Wages did not keep up with inflation. And we didn't think about that as a, as a problem for the Fed to fix because overall inflation was down. So, you know, I mean, this, this gets sort of theoretical, but let's say that we had 6% wage inflation and 5% CPI. There'd be more money in people's pockets, but would we view that as a inflationary period to clamp down on? You know, because we, because we didn't view the inverse as a problem, if you will. So our, our job is to restore price stability and keep price stability. It isn't to keep wages down, and it's certainly not to get involved in trying to establish the appropriate level of labor share of profits, for example. That's, that's not the way we think about it at all. We think about price stability, and when we think about price stability, we think about wages as an important input to that. But we're not, t we're not targeting a particular level of prices, and we, we would never say that we don't wait, want wages, real wages to go up. What we're really charged with is price stability, and to do that, we have to think about wages. But in particular, we're, no one at the Fed would be upset to see the labor share go up. But that's not, that's not something that our policies affect. That's set by global, you know, globalization and the advance of technology and educational sk and skills and aptitude and all those things. That's what drives and productivity. Yeah. That's what drives, you know, um, labor share. Yeah, and, and it's hard to have these conversations in five minutes. I yeah. realize. I'm happy um, to happy to follow. The, up. you know, I, I guess what's what's hard is that like you know also in that 2010 to 2020 period, median home prices went up by 50 yeah. percent. We didn't view that as inflationary. You know, 401ks went up a lot. We didn't view that as inflationary because those were asset increases. And so as we have shifted the gains from, you know, from people who had wealth to people who were dependent on wages, there needs to be some correction. And I, and I leave it there because I'm out of time. But how we think Gentleman's about it. Gentlemen's time is expired. Back. We'll now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes. Thank you for being with us today, Chairman Powell. Uh, Chair Powell, I just want to echo at the, at the outset some of the concerns that my colleagues have raised about Vice Chair Michael Barr's, quote, holistic, unquote, uh, holistic review, unquote, of capital markets, and also about the Fed engaging in climate policy, as well as your decision to put Vice Chair Barr in charge of the Community Reinvestment Act rulemaking. With that said, I'm going to dive right into my questions. Chair Powell, I was pleased to see that the U.S. COIN Task Force released their report on the state of coin a few months ago. Uh, the report notes that the Federal Reserve and U.S. Mint will be jointly contracting with a third party consultant to review the coin supply chain and develop recommendations to, re to improve it. Chairman Powell, could you provide us with an update on what the Fed has learned from its review of the coin circulation issues that occurred during the pandemic? So the um we know that coin, the flow of coins, the natural flow of coins in the economy slowed down a lot because people were staying home and that kind of thing, and they may have switched to non-coin-based uh, uh, means of payment. And we, we feel like that, the evidence is that that's continued now. P people are paying electronically and things like that, and coins are sitting in you know, jars and on people's desks and at home, and they're not circulating back into the banks and thus to the retail stores. And so we're working on that. We're working with the Mint. We're working with all the stakeholders in the, in the coin ecosystem to try to address this problem, and we're well aware of it. So, so it seems to me that what, what we learned from that is that it's probably necessary to have a, a greater reserve of coins if there is such an interruption in the future so that, our, so that commerce is not indeed interrupted. Would you, would you share that broad view? 
That sounds right. I'm not, I'm not an expert. I will say we, we, it feels like we need more, more coins now because more of them are, are sitting in people's uh, homes and, and pockets, and they're not flowing back to where you know, retailers in particular need, need the flow of coins. So I, that sounds right to me. On a related note, could you speak about the importance of maintaining cash as a viable payment option, particularly for those that lack uh, or don't have access to traditional financial services? It's, we think it's absolutely critical because there, there are people who don't have credit cards. Many people don't have credit cards. They don't have good credit, and they need to be paying in cash. And you know, when stores are not, uh, not dealing with people who don't have cash, it's, it's a serious problem for those people in the economy. We, we have it at the, uh, at the Board of Governors, and, and you, you see it elsewhere because most, most payments are now taken care of by credit cards, and it's very efficient. But we need to be looking out for people who, who use cash. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. Uh, picking up on Mr. Lukemeyer's concerns that he expressed earlier, as you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's funding mechanism is intricately linked to the Federal Reserve System. According to Title 10 of Dodd-Frank, each quarter the CFPB director requests an amount that is reasonably necessary to carry out the Bureau's authorities, and the Federal Reserve must transfer that amount so long as it does not exceed 12% of the Federal Reserve's total operating expenses. For the first five years of the existence of CFPB, of course, there was a relaxation there uh, with respect to that 12% cap that allowed $200 million annually to, to be spent beyond that number so long as it was reported, uh, as so long as the reported excess uh, was sent to the President and congressional appropriators. Chair Powell, during your chairmanship, has the Fed ever rejected a CFPB budget request? I do not believe so. And, and could you tell us what policies and procedures are in place at the Fed to ensure that there is no waste, fraud, or abuse, or that these limits are not otherwise exceeded? So we have, we have no role in, in engaging with that. It's re really the, uh, what we share a common inspector general who, who, does, who does work on those issues, but we, we don't in any way we don't have any governance of, of any kind over the CFPB. We're just a source to them. Thank you. I appreciate that insight. In, in closing, Chair Powell, yesterday Senator Warren asked you what you would say to the two million people who may lose their jobs if the Fed keeps raising interest rates. Frankly, Senator Warren should be asking herself the same question when she voted and advocated for the Democrats' reckless spending packages that caused this inflation that we are seeing today and is the reason the Fed has had to raise interest rates, in my view. Frankly, I would call on Senator Warren, the President, and the Democratic Party, uh, for that matter, to apologize to the American people for causing this kitchen table crisis across the country. With that, Chairman, I yield back. Now recognize the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, for joining us today and for your testimony. I'm going to focus my comments and my questions on the high costs that families in my district are seeing because of your interest rate hikes. <clears throat> now, while the Fed has acknowledged that higher interest rates are not the primary driver for the slowdown in price increases, you continue to raise interest rates, risking not only millions of jobs, but also a recession. Based on projections from the Fed, approximately 2 million people will lose their jobs. So that's two million families who will struggle to put food on the table, keep a roof over their heads, and to make ends meet. But the economic hardship does not end there. Mr. Chair, I would like to request a unanimous consent to submit a recent paper by the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland titled Post-COVID Inflation Dynamics into the record. Without objection. Chairman Powell, are you familiar with this publication, uh, yes or no? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, well, let me give you some context. In this paper, the Fed's own economists predict that reaching the 2% inflation goal that you have set will be impossible without causing a recession and spiking the unemployment rate to 7.4%, which translates to millions of working people losing their jobs. Now, Chairman Powell, many economists agree with me when I say that engineering a recession to bring inflation under control is not the right strategy, especially at a time when we are seeing inflation cool in real time, independent of your rate hikes. So on behalf of the people of this country, to prevent a recession, 
yes or no, Chairman Powell, will you pause future interest rate hikes? We're not seeking to uh, to have a recession, and we don't think we need to have a recession to get Respectfully, stability back. Will you pause interest rate hikes, yes or no? I, I don't do yes or no on will I pause the interest rate hikes. Yeah, that's a that's a serious question, um, I, and I can't oh. tell you because I don't know all the facts. I you know that's not we're a. Claiming my time, and if that it is a very serious question because it has a very serious implications. The people who will bear the brunt of an economic recession are our most vulnerable. We know from past experiences that recessions have catastrophic and deeply inequitable consequences. In fact, while some will catch a cold, others will catch pneumonia. But you know that. An economic cold or pneumonia. In fact, in your opening statement, you said, we will stay the course until the job is done. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Could you elaborate, um, what is this effect to communities, families, and businesses, these interest rate hikes? Well, um, right now we're, we're trying to bring down inflation on behalf of all those families. Uh, I think high inflation is hurting, particularly working families all around the country, very badly. And as you know, uh, if, you're, if you're on a very limited budget and you don't have a lot of excess earnings, when prices start going up, you're in trouble right away. People, up middle and upper middle class people have more resources. So we think it's absolutely critical for the working people of this country that we get inflation back under control. And also, while, while we're at it, we have a dual mandate. Apologies, Mr. Chair, I'm just reclaiming my time here. Here's the thing, the most devastating impacts will be to our most vulnerable. Veterans to our most vulnerable. Veterans, the elderly, low-income workers, black and brown workers, those who have often ignored and been neglected in the name of what you refer to as appropriate monetary policy. And yet, you assert that you will stay the course. It's, it's unconscionable, and our most vulnerable workers and families cannot afford to wait for you to realize the harm that you were doing. In my opinion, this sounds more like uh, the assertions of a greedy corporation uh, than someone who has a public mission on behalf of the people of this country. Uh, so uh, one more uh, question uh, with my remaining time here. Uh, Chairman Powell, another consequence of your interest rate hikes has been the increase of the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate to 6.6%, double of what it was two years ago. Do you see this widening inequity in the housing market as a problem? And what steps will you take to make housing more affordable? This is putting a home ownership further and further out of reach uh, for my constituents, new parents, parents, millennials, people of color, uh, contributing to inequities and the racial wealth gap. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, uh, our policies do Gentlemen, affect- Gentlemen, ladies, time's expired. Chairs can submit for the record or answer I'll briefly say that, that uh, if I can, that uh, you know, interest rate policies uh, affect uh, interest-sensitive spending very directly. When we cut rates, they help housing. When when they when they uh, when we raise rates, you see the effect on housing. So thank you, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair Powell, for being with us today. We currently have thirty-two trillion dollars in debt. Our debt to GDP ratio is one hundred and twenty percent the highest it's ever been. And yes, we had a debt ceiling fight brewing for this summer. I would argue it's an opportunity to get our fiscal house in order. But sadly, there's no meaningful bipartisan effort to responsibly address our debt. Both sides have even preemptively started political attacks, alleging either side wants to cut Social Security and health care. But politics and talking points will not fix our problem. Our debt is the greatest national security threat. Social Security will be insolvent in 2033. And our health care system is fundamentally broken. We spend twice as much as the average country per person, and our obesity rate is three times the average. I want to be clear, though. I'm not advocating cuts to Social Security, but my Social Security will have to be different than my father's, and we must change the incentive structures of our health care system. Briefly, let's go over some history. Social Security was created in 1937. The retirement age then was 65, and average life expectancy was 60. Easy to see how that math works. In 1960, Congress raised the retirement age to 67. It has not been increased since then. 
That year, life expectancy was 69. That math still works due to a growing population, but it's getting narrower. Uh, I will throw in another few statistics for uh, that year, 1960. 14% uh, of Americans were obese, and our debt to GDP ratio was 53%. Let's fast forward to this year. Our retirement age is still 67, but our life expectancy is 77. That math clearly does not work, nor is the program functioning in the purpose for which it was designed. And shockingly, our obesity rate is 37%, and we spend $13,000 per person on health care compared to the global average of $6,000 per person and 13% obesity rate. Clearly, our health care system is failing. Our system focuses on managing sickness where we should be facilitating health and wellness. We will only meaningfully be able to address the debt ceiling by focusing on the biggest drivers of our debt. Responsible policymakers should be focused on saving Social Security by reforming it and transforming our healthcare system to facilitate a healthy citizenry capable of working and being contributing members of society. The, Amer the American people deserve more than the political nonsense. Five years ago, the number one issue I ran on was debt. It has been and continues to be our greatest national security risk. I hate to say it, but the last four years has gotten way worse. Congress has spent $7 trillion, of which $5 trillion was done mostly on party lines. The Democrat majority has not only spent money we don't have over the last four years, but their fiscal policy has caused out of control infl inflation, which caused you to raise interest rates. Last year, I asked you if you ever took into consideration the impact of interest rate increases on the cost of our debt service. You appropriately and adamantly said no. Our debt service costs in the next 10 years will be over $10 trillion. I'm gonna point out two things. Number one, that is more than all of our debt service since 1940 combined, the last 80 years. And while you did not take interest rate increases uh, impact on our debt service into your decision making, the best estimate is that those rate increases will increase our debt service costs by $2 trillion in the next 10 years. So basically the $7 trillion that we spent, that the Democrats spent in the last four years, is going to cost us an additional $2 trillion. And that's not factoring in future rate increases as you continue to appropriately try to get inflation under control. As you can tell, this is a huge problem. Uh, the $7 trillion in unnecessary spending in the last four years has caused inflation. Some of my colleagues across the aisle disagree with that causal relationship. Uh, Clinton's Treasury Secretary and Obama's Director of National Economic Council, Larry Summers, wrote an op-ed before they spent the money and said it was going to cause inflation. And he has gone on the uh, I was right tour for the last couple years. Um, we need responsible policymakers to address our debt. Let's talk about what's not serious, and that's minting a trillion dollar coin. Many of my colleagues across the aisle have advocated for this. Luckily, both President Biden and Secretary Yellen have said that this is not a serious proposal, and they have no plans of considering it. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has a bit of a history of doing a 180 when the political winds blow. Most recently, he said he would veto the DC crime bill, and now he's adamantly supporting it and plans to sign it. So, uh, Chair Powell, my only question of you is if Biden and Yellen send you a trillion dollar coin, will you accept it? And, and I, what I will say to that is that this only winds up one way, and that is with Congress raising the debt ceiling. So you will not accept a trillion dollar coin and treat it as a trillion dollars if it's sent to you? I'll add, there, there are no rabbits to be pulled out of hats here. This only ends I, with Congress. I know you don't like yes or no's, but if you are sent a trillion dollar coin and asked to be, asked to treat it as a trillion dollars, will you treat it as a trillion dollars? That would be a rabbit coming out of a head. I'll take that as a no. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Now recognize the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair <clears throat> Powell, for being here. Uh, you have a lot of economic, you know, pro uh, projections, economic projections, uh, various data, um, various uh, reports that are coming out. How much, and you've studied inflation, right? I mean, obviously, it's your number one priority right now. How much is inflation impacted by these three things? Corporate profiteering, executive, egregious executive pay, and the use of share, you know, stock buybacks. So I'm, I don't have numbers, but I, I would say in the case of executive pay and well, in the case of share repurchases, I, I can't think of how it would affect inflation. In the case of executive pay, that would be very small in terms of, uh, of the broader economy. In terms of profits, though, 
The way I think about that is <clears throat> um, profits are high. The places where profits are really high is places where, where there are shortages and, and supply chain issues. And as those things get better, as they are, you're going to see uh, inflation come down and even prices come down, and you'll see corporate margins come down there. And that'll be part of how inflation comes down. So would you, does that corporate profiteering does impact inflation? Do you, you don't have any stats of percentage-wise how much of it yeah. Because you seem, you know, I, I, play, I, I really paid attention to your testimony in the Senate hearing yesterday, and there was a lot of conversation about, you know, my neighbors and residents, wages and so forth. Um, you know, they're finally starting to see a little bit more closer to possibly getting fair wages. It's not even far enough. But I don't know if the Feds is paying closer attention to monopolies, copper, you know, corporate profiteering, and executive egregious pay. All of it, even the stock buybacks, you're saying all of that aside, you're focused more on wages and increasing the interest rate than on those other Our, our focus is really on, on price stability, not, not so much wages. W wages play into that because they're an important cost for business, but they're not, we, we're, not, we're not trying to achieve a, a particular level of wages. We're trying to achieve 2% inflation. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know, Chairman, what we saw during the pandemic is you know, the wealthy and the corporations continue to profit in large scale and still do buybacks and still do executive, really egregious executive pay and benefits and so forth for those at the top. And then, you know, of course, the communities and such were impacted by it. But what I hear consistently is folks thinking that's the reason. We, oh, the, all of a sudden wages are skyrocketing and all this. But all I see is continuation, again, of those that are already getting a huge benefit, you know, the corp, the folks at the top, the, the executives and so forth. I, you know, my friend Glenn taught me this today, that the feds are actually sitting on, you know, something in Dodd-Frank section 956. You all are sitting on the last 12 years on mm -hmm. guidance regarding executive cons compensation and the high risks of it. Like around, you know, there was some sort of proposal done, not implemented, again, it's been 12 years, why is that something that you're not concerned about regarding inflation? Well, like you guys are sitting, a, one, you're sitting on it, right? Why? Well, it's, it's been 12 years. And then two, why is that you're saying that's not big, big, big deal? That's not going to impact the cost of so, products and so forth for our residents? It's a multi-agency rule, and there have been repeated attempts to get five or six or seven, however many it is, agencies to agree. That's one thing. On uh, disclosures? No, no, this is on, it's, it's on policies to... Um, yeah, which include disclosures and arrangements regarding executive pay the and the risk are, of it. Uh, there. Uh, it's, anyway, 956 is, you're right, we haven't been able to get agreement among the agencies. But m more to the point, um, you know, there are boards long since, for, this is just for the big banks where we have this authority, long since um, board of directors are, are very focused on on how executive compensation works <clears throat> and that it not reward, uh, you know, unnecessarily risky behavior and that kinds of things. Yeah, but in Dodd-Frank, which Congress passed, there should, you know, you're supposed to put something in place. And it's, it's, there's not, it's not in place. And look, I'm saying this because so many people in this chamber, and, and I feel like the feds are more obsessed with wages than they are in regards to the monopolies, the corporate profiteering, there hasn't been any, I mean, really, I don't think there is a laser focus on that. And it's really, you know, because so I think the feds and Congress policy. can support fair wages and still combat inflation if you are fair in combating egregious executive pay, monopolies, and corporate profiteering. We don't do competition, competition policy, and we also don't, broadly speaking, regulate corporate wages. But, but 956 would have expired. addressed it. 956 time. addresses it. You should have implemented uh, it's 12 years. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Appreciate you coming in. Um, I, I, I don't have to tell you the fact that housing, so goes housing, so goes the economy. I'm from a state that, uh, from South Carolina, we have people moving in, the population's increasing. And I can tell you housing, not just single family housing, is in trouble. People are finishing the what's in the pipeline. It's now affected multifamily, apartments, uh, the high rents that they did get with inflation. That's entirely caused, uh, for the most part, by the policies of, uh, of this administration with gas, buying it from other countries, with 
supply chain shortages. There's no reason to start a project when you can't get supplies. And that's what we're facing in the housing industry at all levels. Uh, so any increase in interest is just another, uh, another um, dagger that's going to kill the housing industry along with commercial projects that, again, the pipeline's filling up, but uh, the pipeline, once it leaves, you're not going to have any. And I'm from a state that's with people moving in. One of the things that you hear, I think Mr. Davidson mentioned, was regulations. Banks are complaining about over, being overregulated and the costs associated with it. CRA, I know when Brainyard left, um, it's in a state of flux. Who's, who's determining that and when do you, will you have some guidelines out? That'll be done by the whole Board of Governors when we vote on it and also by the OCC and the FDIC. Will they have any input from those who are having to pay the price of implementing CRA? Like uh, get any input from banks that are having, yeah, to, yes. having to navigate? So uh, I, I know that throughout the multi-year process, there's been a tremendous amount of interaction with banks, tremendous amount, and bank, bank lobby groups and, and, uh, and also consumer groups. And then, um, but, but yeah, there's been a ton of input and, you know, working with the industry to try to make, try to achieve these statutory goals efficiently. I won't say it's perfect, but there's certainly been a lot of interaction. So they're getting input prior to implementing the requirements for CRA or the guidelines for CRA? Yes, I think there's, I, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure there's been quite a bit of interaction with, with the industry in terms of what, you know, what to do and how to do it. Okay. Now, I think you've stated that you don't feel it's the Federal Reserve's uh, policy to get into implementing climate change. We're not, we, we're not and we shouldn't be <clears throat> climate policymakers. We do have a small role, a you know, focused role to play principally with the larger banks to make sure they understand and can manage their climate risks in the long run. Should it be mandated? Should what be mandated? Climate change. Um, policies be mandated by the Federal Reserve? You know, I think, again, b climate change is something that's going to affect uh, businesses and people and regions and states and, and whole countries, and I think that's that's got to be a job for uh, elected people by and large. I think what we're going to affect is we just want to make sure that banks understand and can manage the risks that, that, that they're running, and these are principally longer-term risks. What's concerning to those us, of us in the business community who have to borrow for banks, uh, you're con the Federal Reserve is conducting a pilot uh, climate scenario analysis that's being mandated, not asked, it's being mandated for the six banks, six largest banks to participate in. Uh, that seems to me like a pretty good, when you, when you have to do a scenario and mandate that they do this, that's, is that not the Federal Reserve getting directly involved in mandating? You know, <clears throat> I think the banks actually want this. They, they want the, these six big banks, they have to face this globally. And what they want is uniform approaches and guidance on how to have one set of rules. They're, they're already running, the big six banks that we're talking to, they're already running climate scenarios all the time, multiple climate scenarios. There were, most of the banks are well capitalized now. That could change. And this is just another expense that is out there. Um, on the CFPB, the history, I think you said it was 12%. Uh, it cannot go above 12% uh, ratio. Has that, I mean, that does not seem logical to me. Has it ever been below the 12% from your perspective? You know, that's, someone here uh, quoted the law and that, that, that rang a bell for me. Uh, so that is, that is what the law says. Have they been below? I, I'd have to go back. I'm happy to provide it. It's, it's all if you could, because it seems to provide. me like that's a man. It's, it's um, if you've got that cap, businesses couldn't operate like that, uh, because it would be no incentive to reduce the price as long as it's automated. That's thank the way, you. That's the way the law is set up. Right. Thank you for being here. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being with us today. Uh, the the end is in sight. Uh, I would like to begin by highlighting an issue that has been a concern for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and others. I know that the chairman has suggested that we're going to weave in the diversity and inclusion issues throughout our hearing, so, so here goes my concern. Uh, there has never been a Latino Federal Reserve president, uh, and further, only about 5% of the Federal Reserve's overall workforce identifies as Hispanic or Latino. 
As we know, over the past year or so, there have been several presidential vacancies at the Federal Reserve Banks, and there has still been consistent failure to appoint a Latino candidate. Chair Powell, are you aware of this trend, and do you agree that it's a problem that our diversi diversity and inclusion numbers are in the Federal Reserve Board are not <laughs> reflective of the Latino population? Yes, it's something we've been focusing on. All right, and can we get a commitment from you that you'll work on the workforce issues internally? Yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to now um, follow up a little bit on some of the questions from uh, Representative Norman, because I too have a concern about housing costs, particularly as it relates to equity uh, and the negative impact on minority communities. Uh, I think you said in your paper uh, that activity in the housing sector continues to weaken, largely uh, reflecting higher mortgage rates. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, the rates are higher, not only impacting single-family housing, but, but uh, multifamily housing. And it's also becoming even more uh, and more uh, difficult uh, for people in my district, which is 77% 77, 77 Latino, uh, to be able to buy their first time first home buyer, uh, you know, the workforce, entry level kind of housing. As financing homes get harder as mortgage uh, to find and, and mortgage rates rise, the population of home buyers is skewing towards older, wealthier, and wider communities. In many cases, in our suburbs, equity firms are buying out the housing stock. Chair Powell, can you please speak about the relationship, relationship between Federal Reserve interest rate hikes and housing inequity, and what needs to change here? Well, <clears throat> what needs to change is we need to get inflation under control so that uh, interest rates can come back down. In the meantime, they're high because inflation is hurting all of your constituents, not just the, the housing sector, uh, and all of everybody's constituents. And um, it's our job under the law to get to restore price stability and also to, to, to keep maximum employment. Is there anything else that Congress can be doing in this respect? That would be up to Congress, but I, you know, there are lots of ways in which Congress can support people in various ways, uh, but that's, that's, really, that's really in your hands. Right. Now I'd like, I want to move on into the numbers that you mentioned uh, again in your remarks at page two. You mentioned that, the, of course, we all know there's been a record historic unemployment rate. It's down now to 3.4 percent. The lowest, I believe, in history, and thank you, Mr. President, for that. Uh, but you also mentioned that there's 1.9 job openings for each unemployed individual. I wondered if you, if you could tell me how you define unemployed individual. What does the unemployment, unemployed individual profile look like? So that, that has a very specific meaning. Uh, it's, it's someone who is not working but is actively seeking a job. So for example, if you take six months off and stop looking for a job, you're no longer unemployed. So that means there's a group of people who are kind of around the edges of the labor force who don't count as unemployed, um, and, and those people are marginally attached to the labor force, that, that kind of thing. But, but to be actually unemployed, you've got to be looking actively for work in the statistics. Right, so it does not include people who are perhaps disabled and cannot find accommodations in the workplace to be able to get a job. Unless they're looking for it. If, if you, it's, the, question, the test is whether you're actively looking, I think, in the last Actively years. looking regardless of, you know, um, age, you know, yeah, that's right. whether or not they're... It's not a value judgment. It's just it's the way we assess unemployment. We look at the other groups, too, but actual unemployment is... What, how do you factor in the people that actually have our un unemployment insurance? Sorry? How do you factor in the people who are on unemployment insurance? Well, they're unemployed. They've, they've got to be, by definition, un we count them as unemployed or they wouldn't qualify under the state uh, requirements. All right. Well, I just want to make sure that we, we clearly understand that, <clears throat> that there's children, there's people that are older, people that are disabled, people that can't, can't uh, find daycare. There's so many other reasons why someone is unemployed. All right, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, the chair of the House Administration Committee is recognized for five minutes. Chairman Powell, thank you for being here with us today. Your, your testimony today has been insightful as we look to tackle inflation, the impact that it's having on families across the United States right now. 
I wanna go back to a, a comment that, that was quoted to you as regards to a question from uh, Senator Kennedy yesterday regarding the impact that fiscal policy uh, is having uh, as it relates uh, to inflation. And, and the quote that was attributed to you uh, was that it wasn't a big factor. As we look at kind of a whole host of policies here on Capitol Hill from reckless spending that we saw uh, in, the, in the previous Congress, um, a lack of what we just discussed, individuals who are outside the labor market, how do we get these folks back into the labor market, whether or not we have policies uh, that are discouraging folks uh, to come back into work. As we look at high energy costs and opportunity uh, to drive uh, lower, to drive energy prices lower uh, by unleashing American energy, how do, you, how do you factor in the fiscal policies or how should policymakers factor in the fiscal policies and their impact that that's also having an inflation? Not, to get, not looking for your advice on the fiscal policies because I know you want to stay out of that, but how should, how should lawmakers be looking at the fiscal policy and its impact on inflation? So let's take energy for example. So remember, inflation is the change in prices. It's not the level, as you, as you well know. So energy prices have been coming down. Right, they're, they're still high, but they've been coming down, and they're contributing negatively to headline inflation. So, it, so when I say it's not contributing to inflation, that's what I mean. In addition, if you look at the at aggregate spending, it was, you know, it peaked, and then it's been coming down. So the fiscal impulse is actually negative at this point. It's no longer, the, most of the inflation that we now have, something like two-thirds of the contribution of inflation in core um, PCE inflation comes from the services sector. And it's not, that isn't really about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy was important at the very beginning, so was monetary policy, by the way, but now it's more about just inflation is, is, uh, is out there and you have to bring it down. It, it's, uh, it, the record is it doesn't come down by itself it, unless it's driven by you know, transitory factors. For example, uh, in the goods sector, the supply chains have been getting better and as that's happened, goods inflation has come way down and, and sometimes it's negative now. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, th thank you. And is, is we're, so, so to take that one step further, we're waiting on the president's budget. It's over a month late, but we're anticipating receiving that in the near term. And as we look at interest payments on the debt and the cash flow implications that that, that, that has, not asking for what you're going to do at the next board meeting for obvious reasons, but as you are in those deliberations to future board meetings and potential rate increases, how does the impact of interest on the debt factor into the calculus of you and uh, your colleagues? So we don't, we don't look at that. We're not, um, you know, if we started to change our monetary policy because, uh, because we were concerned about the level of, of debt payments and things like that, that's, that's not something that the United States needs to do and it's not something that we do do. Why would, it, why would it be something the United States doesn't need to do? What do you, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, we, we, we're gonna do our job. Congress has given us the job, maximum employment, price stability, regulate the banks, manage the payment system to some extent. That, we'll do those jobs. We don't have to worry about the United States budget. That is not our job. And you know, it's, it, it, isn't that, it isn't that the debt today is unsustainable, it's that the path is unsustainable. So we can service our debts, it's just that we're on an unsustainable path, meaning that, that the debt is growing faster than the economy. So we, we would never consider, we will never look you know, it, it, if a central bank has to avoid taking actions because it's concerned about the budget, that's called fiscal dominance, and that's that's a thing you don't see among advanced economies. And, and it would be something we, you know, we're, we think we're a long way from that. Thank, thanks, thanks for your feedback on that point. The CBO just released their report showing uh, potential interest payments on the debt uh, accelerating dramatically over the next decade, uh, showing it would be 14% of our uh, fiscal spend. Uh, to compare that, right, national defense would be 13, social security is also 14, so it's in that level. Th that's, a, that's a policymaker issue, uh, but your insights is that are helpful. I know I only have a few seconds left, and a, and a handful of my colleagues um, have commented on the uh, ongoing review of bank capital standards. I just want to echo uh, those concerns about what the impact would be of a significant uh, capital level uh, increase. Um, could you just comment briefly about how you quantify the cost of higher capital uh, in the supposed benefits and, and how you how you balance out that that risk uh, and reward? So it's it's always a balance, exactly as you say. We we know that you know the the uh, the capital increases that I supported back in uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, it, earlier in my time at the Fed, they made the bank stronger and they made them more resilient. And you really want that. You want a banking system that can stand up and keep doing its job in times of crisis. So 
but but the exact balance between that and the availability of capital and the cost of capital is is always going to be a matter of judgment. Thank you very so, much. I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the member of Congress representing Atlanta, the city with the highest racial wealth gap in the country, I'm focused on creating an economy of inclusion, an economy that works for everyone and brings the most marginalized into our economy. Americans and Atlantans flourish when the economy works for everyone. The Federal Reserve has a mandate of maximum employment that is measured by analyzing various data points of economic conditions. In 2020, the Federal Reserve updated its approach to fulfilling and measuring this mandate to include job growth that was broad-based and inclusive. Chairman Powell, do you agree that broad-based and inclusive growth means job growth that helps reduce racial, employment, unemployment, and wage disparities? I think it means what it, what it says. We don't, we don't, remember, we don't target any particular, uh, we can't really target a particular racial or ethnic group with that, but we, we like to think that that our decisions are informed by an understanding of, of diverse groups across the economy. Well, Chairman Powell, could you share examples of how the Fed is including broad-based and inclusive job growth in the maximum employment mandate? Sure, I'd be glad to. So one thing we do is we always, uh, it's always part of the, uh, the data that we look at at each meeting. We always talk about it, we always mention it. Different, different uh, uh, unemployment rates and labor force participation rates and wage rates and things like that by racial, ethnic, gender groups and that kind of thing. That's always in the data that we look at and talk about. That's, that's the first thing. So it, it informs our pursuit of maximum employment. We're, take, we're trying to take a broader and more inclusive understanding of what that statutory goal means. Thank you. Two weeks ago, the Federal Trade Commission released data indicating that Georgians reported the most fraud and scam claims of any other state in 2022, amounting to millions of stolen money. The Federal Reserve's website has resources to help consumers protect themselves from scams where criminals leverage the Federal Reserve's name, including emails claiming potential victims are eligible for lottery winnings, robocalls threatening arrest in exchange for money, and other phishing communications. Chairman Powell, how does the Federal Reserve measure whether its counter-fraud communications are reaching the most vulnerable households and communities, especially those that might not be following the Federal Reserve press releases or your website, or have limited access to broadband? So we, we do, when, when those kind of scams happen, particularly when they involve us, we, we go on social media to, make, to try to reach people and tell them that if they're contacted by someone pretending to be a, social, a, a, a Federal Reserve person, it's, that's not so we do that. We also we work with our inspector general who, who works with law enforcement to make sure that law enforcement's involved. So we're aware of these scams. You know, I think you're talking about the ones that involve people pretending to be a Federal Reserve person and get in touch with me and, and I'll, you know, we'll, and we'll send you some money. And so we, we do what we can to reach out to the public on that. So that is that after the fact, but what what happens before so that the general public is aware that this is happening for those people who are not on social media or tracking your, is there another way to get this information out to the general public? It's real, that's, we do what we can. You know, we're not, uh, we're not an institution that's, that deals with the general public very much. You know, we deal with banks and we, and of course our, our rate hikes and, and rate cuts, our monetary policy affects all Americans. But um, I think when, when something like that happens, it's a broad program, it's, it's a bunch of people who are per perpetuating a fraud on many, many people and we try to get out there quickly and re try to reach people and again, also alert law enforcement. Thank you, um, Chairman. And Chairman McHenry, I yield back the balance of my time. That is very kind and gracious of you. The first of the day. We need to commend that for the record. Um, <laughs> uh, with that, we'll recognize the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman McHenry. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for being with us. <clears throat> Chairman, is the, is the Fed's commitment regarding ESG uh, not to force investment banks to renege on their fiduciary responsibilities? We don't actually, we don't actually uh, have policies in effect in that, in that space. That's, okay. not, that's you, not an assignment that we have. You saw some, some issuances by heads of some investment banks, not to mention any names, that felt that that was the case. That the Fed was asking them to, you know, we don't... SEC, Fed, you, you stated a, a couple of minutes ago that... that you, you, you feel that some sort of ESG, you, you stated that banks want it. And I'm talking, no, that's, that's, that's different, completely different. It's, it's, you know, regulated financial institutions that we regulate and supervise 
uh, they were subject to the pretty right. big ones were subject so, to so the Fed, climate change. So you'll agree that the Fed won't, all over the country. won't ask banks to renege on their fiduciary responsibilities. The Fed won't do that. I, I, you know, we don't, we don't regulate the investment banks. The SEC does. Okay. So the answer is no. What's the question again? I'll move on. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, some of my colleagues and Chairman McHenry uh, questioned the holistic review of the capital uh, uh, bank holdings. Uh, this holistic review, which no one has seen, according to uh, my sources, uh, but there are published reports that it will call for more capital uh, to be held by banks. Um, I understand the deferral to Vice uh, Chair Barr, but do you have anything uh, that you could add that would warrant a need for l large banks' capital increase? So there, there isn't a proposal to evaluate or talk about yet. Um, Vice Chair Barr has indicated he was going to take a look. He said he thinks capital is strong, and the question really is, is it strong enough? And he, I know he's been working, and, and there'll, be a, there'll be a process when he does arrive at conclusions. He, he has no authority to enact something himself. It has to go through the Board of Governors, also through the FDIC <coughs> and the OCC. Okay, <coughs> this has so nothing to do with the QT, process. I'm sorry, with sorry. the QT initiative, the uh, tightening of the money supply? They're not related at all? No. No, I would say okay. not. Are you comfortable with the, the QT reductions which have taken place? Yes, the balance sheet is, um, we, we have uh, the balance sheet moving down at a, at a healthy clip, and it seems to be going pretty well. Okay, Very so well. the Biden administration's fiscal and energy policy has caused trillions in deficit spending, uh, as you well know, very, very excessive trillions. Uh, meanwhile, energy costs for the average American have from, from heating oils to gasoline have increased by over 40% and businesses, of course, in the last, just over the last two years. So high energy obviously affects the cost for manufacturing, wages, uh, general cost of living in almost every aspect of society. Wouldn't, would not such fiscal and energy policy work of the Biden administration working hand in hand with initiatives such as QT and initiatives of the Fed be far more effective than the Fed fighting inflation on your own? Well, I mean, we, we, so we are the agency that has the responsibility to restore price stability, and we just have to do it. That's, that's, what, that's the task we've been given under the law. It's great if Congress helps, it's great if the administration helps, but you know, we have to deliver it, and we will. We're, that's our responsibility, which we, which we fully accept. We're not risking stagflation if the fiscal policy and monetary policy are working against each other? You know, again, we, we, uh, we don't comment on fiscal policy. That's, what, that's for elected people uh, and, who've, uh, and you know, we have a job, maximum employment and price stability. We use our tools, we try to stick, we try to stay in our lane, stick to okay. our netting. It's just the fear of a number of people that we're gonna have high interest rates and um, higher than 2% inflation if, if there's not that level of Fiscal and monetary cooperation. Again, fiscal I. policy does what it's going to do. We we take that as exogenous. You know, that's the fiscal policy will be what you and your colleagues do with you know, uh, and and we will we that that comes into the economy and we see it and we we just we don't have a view. We don't try to comment on on on, on the decisions that you make and we use our tools to restore price stability no matter what happens outside of our building. Sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. We now recognize the ranking member of the Oversight Subcommittee, Mr. Green of Texas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Powell, for being with us today. I greatly appreciate your work. But I would like to take just a few moments to talk about how our legislative bodies have legitimized systemic racism. It's been done by having a Fed that has a responsibility to produce maximum employment, knowing that the two to one black white gap, wage gap exists <clears throat> traditionally. And also knowing that traditional actions and methodologies will not change that. But yet, we won't give you the authority to make recommendations or to take actions that would directly target that. It's not your fault. 
It's the legislative body's fault. We perpetuate systemic racism in your mandate of maximum employment. We also perpetuate it in lending because we know, we know that invidious discrimination exists in lending. We know it exists. And there are laws that will prevent and punish persons who cheat banks. You, you will be prosecuted and you will be fined criminally if you cheat a bank. No such law exists if you cheat a customer. And we know that black people who are more qualified than whites will get less money when they get a loan and pay a higher interest rate. These are all things that are the case, they're true. So legislative bodies continue to legitimize systemic racism. And the bodies have become so bold now, so many of the members, they're so bold now as to say they're sick and tired of hearing about this. They don't, they don't want a discussion about racism and systemic discrimination. They believe that all is well as long as all is well in the white world. But many, they won't say it that way, Mr. Powell, but that's the way their actions would lead one to conclude they have positioned themselves. Many of these people are my friends. People that I associate with, talk to regularly. But there comes a time when you just have to be truthful. Systemic racism can be eliminated. It can be dealt with. We know how to, but we don't have the will to do it. So I don't, I don't fault you. I don't fault you. Not, not one scintilla of blame would I cast your way. It's the legislative body. It's the people who sit on this committee who won't allow laws to be passed, making it a crime to deny a person a loan who is qualified to get that loan. People on this committee who will say they don't want to hear anymore and encourage persons who are professionals, experts, encourage them to push back against talk about invidious discrimination. Systemic racism emanates from the legislative body. And you, sir, are in a very awkward position because I genuinely believe that you'd like to do something about it, but you can't. It creates a sad state of affairs. I thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired and yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, is recognized for five minutes. Chairman, thanks for being here today. Um, probably get right under the wire here. Um, I, I just had one, and some of my colleagues have touched on this today again, that there's certainly, I think we're well aware, I'm well aware that there's a, a dynamic back in the district and across this nation. There's a certain segment of adults, 25 to 35 year olds, many of them dual income, no kids, and they are completely froze out of the housing market right now, either because the cost of a home at a new subdivision in any municipality is a half a million dollars or more. Um, and as a result of that, it's, it's uh, not only by actions of the Fed, I think, on the interest rates, uh, but certainly the other thing I wanted to bring up, because the balance sheet at the Fed has gone from four trillion to nine post-pandemic, um, could the Fed, by no longer buying mortgage-backed securities, uh, in a smaller universe of the private sector buyers who, who demand a higher rate of return, right? 
Is there not uh, another kind of built-in trigger there that mortgage rates are going to continue to go higher unrelated to what the Fed does? Because I, I, I think the concern is that between the dynamics of new, new, no new subdivisions, uh, 25 to 35 year olds unable to get a loan, and then uh, interest rates continuing to climb, all of these factors are just, we're gonna lose a generation of adults here that are never gonna get home ownership. They're never gonna benefit, you know, which we all know is the big wealth builder for any family. So I'm, I'm just, if there's anything I take away from what we heard today and the questions asked, I hope that um, that is something that the Fed is, is in tune to and is looking at closely. One thing is that uh, the this, this, this challenge with supply nationally, and that's zoning, it's people, it's materials. And so ha there, you know, the housing stock is constrained to some extent by just harder to find zoning anymore because you know, things are so built up in so many places. And those are not things that we can control. In terms of our ownership of mortgage-backed securities, what happens with them is they mature, or they're, prepaid, they're pre repaid or prepaid, and they run off on their own. That's a passive, uh, passive sort of way to shrink the balance sheet. And of course, they don't, they don't run off very quickly when rates are this high because people are not refinancing their mortgages because they have much lower mortgages, mortgage rates. So, you know, there's no evidence at this point that, uh, you know, that the market's having a hard time absorbing, uh, you know, the, the supply of mortgages because the supply of new mortgages is very low. It's probably right, it has to be right, that, that uh, when, when we're no longer buying mortgages, and we won't be, we're not buying mortgages now, and I hope we don't have to buy any more mortgage-backed, we don't buy individual, you know, we buy mortgage-backed securities. I hope we're not doing that anytime soon. We only do that in, in really, uh, severe situations that they're you know the, the fixed income markets are, are gigantic and there's a lot of buyers out there and where there's a yield uh, there'll be buyers and, and I think that that will I expect that'll be the case it, it might not that it wouldn't have some upward pressure on uh, on rates for us not to be a buyer anymore but you know we, we weren't a buyer for a very long time we thought we'd never go back in after the global financial crisis and we, we kind of had to after the pandemic financial crisis just to keep the markets working and, and now we've stopped again. Good, thank you very much, Chair, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Noteworthy. Uh, I wanna thank uh, in particular our members, Mr. Fitzgerald and Ms. Ms. Williams for uh, their additional minutes back to the Fed Chair. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a rate environment like this, time is money and that's much more valuable these days. Um, I'd like to thank the Chair for his testimony. Um, and uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days with whom which to submit additional written questions for the uh, witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for his response. I ask uh, you, Chair Powell, to please respond as promptly as you're able. Uh, and with that, the hearing's adjourned. Thank you.